everybody, it's Romania Black, and guess who's ready to be done with Volume 6 of Heaven Official's Blessing? Me! <laughs> I'm ready to be done with it. I am ready for Volume 7. Bring it on. Goodbye. <laughs> I, here's, the, the struggle is, the story gets better and better. Each volume of this story is better than the last, which has me very excited for volume seven and eight because I'm like it's been ramping up and everything gets better and better and I trust MXTX has great things still in store because there's so many loose threads right with the story but I'm not gonna lie after the last two weeks I'm done <laughs> stick a fork in me I'm done I'm ready to move on this was fun not really but I'm 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 ready to put it on the shelf <laughs> And be like, okay, good. The, I, I honestly would reread the front of this volume. Like the, the stuff in Mount Tonglu where, where Shilian has the confession to Hua Chong finally. And when they're about to go into the kiln and everything. Like that stuff I would read again. That's, that's good romance. But people have been sharing in the Discord all of this Hualian stuff from the past volumes. And I'm like, I miss that. <laughs> I'm ready to, I, the, the, from the midway point on of this volume, I don't think I'm ever going to read it again <laughs> because I'm going to have to experience it in the audio drama. I'm going to have to experience it in the live action and I'm going to have to experience it in the Donghua eventually. I'm going to see this all three times over again. Why am I reading it again? No. <laughs> I cried last chapter said. I cried a lot. I had to pull it together because I'm not usually an emotional, I'm usually very internally emotional. Like I'm screaming on the inside and on the inside my heart is breaking and I'm sad, but externally I don't usually cry and get sad with things. I'm not one of those reactors. And so for this story to pull it out of me and you knew it was coming, you just knew it, but you were like, damn it, MXTX, I, how dare you? So we still have five chapters left. Chapters 194, 195, 196, 197, and 198. There was no way, there was no way to really split it up without it being like a 10 page section and a 40 page section, which I don't want to do just a week of reaction. It'd be 30 minutes. No, that's not how we roll here. So I was like, well, I'll just read all five chapters together, finish this book out and then have us start. And what's really funny is that we're going to be starting volume seven around the time that season two of the Donghua is coming out on my channel. And I, it's going to be needed. <laughs> Looking back at volume two content and, and the stuff that's probably going to be in season two, I'm like, oh man, that's going to feel real good <laughs> after reading these chapters. That's going to feel real great. So um, I have decided after talking with people on Discord that I do think it is a good idea to when I do react to the Donghua to have a spoiler corner. So just so you all know, when we start the Donghua, I'm going to go into the Donghua acting Donghua only and being like, oh, this is how we, this is where we last left off. <laughs> what, what dire times they seemed. And then, <laughs> and then when we get to the end of the discussion for the episode, then we'll do like a Donghua spoiler corner where we can talk about this stuff in relation. It is going to be a lot of fun because everybody has talked about how re-readable and re-watchable this series is. It's going to be a lot of fun to go back and actually do that in the form of the Donghua and just see things that maybe I didn't notice before that show up and things that hit you harder the second time around. That stuff's going to be very interesting and I'm excited for that. And it's going to be a nice little catharsis after this section to go back and experience that. So Yay. And plus it'll be fun to watch week to week with you all because I didn't get the chance really to do that with the Dong Wah the first time. I didn't get to watch week to week with you all. So this will be a lot of fun. Um, and I'm excited about that. So yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I've got um, only a couple comments before we start this madness here. Um, only a couple comments. Most of the comments were just like, isn't this bad? And I'm like, yes. So most of them were all just talking about how terrible things are, which mm -hmm, agree wholeheartedly. Although Anime Annie and SQQLBH314 had some really good comments that I wanted to bring up. Uh, Anime Annie talks about how Bai Wusheng making Xilin sit up in his lap is very reminiscent of Xilin acting like the puppet master in the forest on the way to Mount Tonglu. And I was like, oh my god. There's so many things, again, like I said last week, 
I believe that Shi Lian and Bai Wusheng are two separate individuals, but right now they're merging in weird ways that kind of suspend your sense of reality. And you're like, is Shi Lian different than Bai Wusheng? Are they the same person? Have they always been the same person? How is that even possible? It just really disorients you and makes you question everything. So the idea that there could be maybe some lingering ramifications from that entire process that Shi Lian's going through now in the way that he acts is so crazy and it's also like the fact that Shi Lian and Hua Chong are working together doing these sinister things and now we see them together I kind of see why again Jun Wu I said this last week I see why Jun Wu doesn't really want Shi Lian around Hua Chong because he's like um Hua Chong's kind of an enabler he'll do whatever you want him to but the thing of it is Shi Lian is for better or worse in a much more calm state now than he was at this point in the story so uh it does it is disturbing though to have that implication of Bai Wusheng using Shi Lian like a puppet and then it kind of comes back in the forest that makes that whole scene a lot creepier and I don't know what to think about it I'm like it kind of taints that one scene that I was like oh that's so cute and funny and now I'm like mm, it's not so cute and funny anymore um and then the family of three attacking Shi Lian in chapter 190 is very reminiscent of the family of three that started the war with Yongin back in the flashback arc uh, in volume three. And I was like, mm, mm hmm It's just that rule of three, right? That rule of three getting you, isn't it? <laughs> I was like, oh God, why, why? And then finally, um, SQQ, uh, HB, SQQ LBH 314 is talking about how what's interesting in the story, and we kind of talked about this in the comments section, is that it really brings to light that everyone in this story, regardless if you're a heavenly official, regardless of if you're a mortal, regardless of if you're a ghost, they all started out as human. Regardless of where they ended up and the powers that they attained, they all came from a same source, which is very important because when we see in chapter 190, Shi Lian putting put up on the pedestal and being worshipped as a god, but then they drag him down and dehumanize him and say, well, you've actually done bad and we can stab you and everything and you still don't die. All of those things, it just shows how there was no enlightened power with Shi Lian. And that kind of relates now to why Shi Lian is like, I don't want anybody worshipping me. No, no, no. That Did you not? I learned last time not to think those things, right? But also it goes back to the phrase that said between Shi Lian and Hua Chong about saying, it's not you, it's not, it's you, not the state of you. Meaning regardless of if you're a ghost, regardless of if you're a heavenly official, regardless of if you're just a mortal, then it's still you, regardless of what your condition is. And Hua Chong is so perfect to say that to because he's gone from being this kid to this ghost fire to this savage ghost, which as Anime Annie pointed out, is the state that Chi Rong is currently in. Chi Rong never reached his final evolution. Chi Rong's been having the Eviolite for like <laughs> 800 years, never to uh, evolve again, <laughs> which I think is for the best. I, I, Chi Rong needs to stay a savage, right? Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, there's still so many questions. We still have two entire volumes. There are so many plot points yet to be resolved. But man, uh, we can go back to that main story anytime now. And I, I don't think we are at the end of this. I, I feel like so far, whenever we have ended books, I mean, we have volumes, which are these, but the books themselves were technically, even though this is volume six, we are on book four. So anytime we've ended a book, I don't think it's been... At the end of a volume I think it always starts in the next volume at least a little bit so I am fully anticipating that we're not done with volume four in this chapter set I feel like it's gonna continue on into volume seven a little and then get to or maybe a lot I honestly before we start this if I'm pausing theories we have volume seven and volume eight volume seven shorter than this volume <sighs> which is frustrating because I, I want more heaven officials blessing and we're getting less but sometimes less is more so I can't complain as I walked into this volume being like oh god it's it's so short what are we gonna <laughs> and y'all were like mm -hmm. yeah it's short you want it to be short so I I feel like I shouldn't complain because sometimes you get a lot more than you bargain for and you can't trust MXTX quality over quantity but um I feel like book four is going to carry over if I'm making a prediction now I feel book four is going to carry over at least until a fourth or a third of the way, at least through volume seven. 
and that's going to give us the rest of volume seven into volume eight to wrap up the story and then the rest of volume eight is going to be like if i'm thinking like modan zushi the rest of volume eight is going to be like the aftermath and any extras that we get things like that now i don't know i could be wrong i've i've been wrong many times reading this story so i'm not holding my breath but yeah mm -hmm. but it's on page 299 to 348 so we've got about about 50 pages today to get through and so that's all I know, but I, I'm ready. We're not going to do a man watch after this week. I am going to wait after this chapter set until next weekend when we will have a chapter. It'll be chapter, I've got, I've got my little sheet wrote out here, which is exciting. Chapter 98 of the man -wa. I already have volume seven planned out. Uh, Anime Annie sent me uh, the chapter breakdowns. So we will have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We'll have 10 parts to uh, volume seven, which we only had nine parts of volume six, so there's that. We had 11 parts of um, volume five, so so yeah, we just have, basically we had 12 parts in volume four, that was the longest, 11 parts with volume five. Uh, volume six only had nine parts, and this one has 10, volume seven has 10, so we're just a little bit shorter pages, but they're gonna be spread out a little bit more. Uh, this chapter, this volume had a lot of chunks. And so there's that. So next week will be uh, chapter 98 of the Manwa and the next, the first set of chapters to uh, start us out with volume seven, which is exciting. So mm -hmm. the good news is I will have volume eight by the time that, by the time that we end volume seven, I will have volume eight to go right into it. So that's, that's good. I think if I plan it out, I told the discord this, if I plan it out, um, I honestly think that we're going to get uh, volume eight on Patreon on Christmas day. <laughs> We're going to start volume eight on Patreon on Christmas day. What a wonderful Christmas surprise, right? That'll be great. I'm excited about that. So I'll be like celebrating Christmas with a good old volume eight. Yes. To start us off. So huzzah. But yeah, I, I've talked enough. I'm not going to waste any more time, but I am super nervous. <laughs> to see what this volume set chapter last chapter set of volume six gives us they got to end off somewhere so what are we going to do but we're not going to waste any more time we are going to dive into the last chapter set of volume six chapters 194 to 198 of heaven officials blessing and we're going to do that here in three two one and let's go chapter 194 nameless ghost Offering a nameless flower. Ooh, okay. All right. I'm going to throw this to Huck. Shelian's emotions were still deeply sunken in the screaming of those resentful spirits, and he couldn't quite regain himself for the moment, so he responded distractedly, don't address me by that title. Yeah, because that's when they saw every time he heard someone address him like that, it was as if, it was as if they were reminding him of something, making him prefer feel particularly irritated. Every such call would make his heart jolt. No, nope, it's because Bai Wuxing's trying to take him over and Hua Chong is like, your highness. And he's like, oh, I don't want to think about that title because it's giving, it's keeping Shi Lian alive. Yes. Your highness will forever be your highness. Shi Lian glanced over. Of course he couldn't see the face of this black clad warrior. Of course he couldn't and could only see a smiling face. Yet when he gazed, when the other gazed upon his face, he could only see a tragically white mask. Shillian said coldly, if you keep calling me by that title, I'll disperse your soul. Don't think yourself to actually be that strong. The black clad youth bowed his head and did not speak. Yes. So, oh my God. So yeah, but that, that part seems like it's Bai Wu Sheng trying to be like, quit calling me that or I'll kill you. And because Shi Lian would never say that to Bai Wu, to Hua Chong and Hua Chong's like, okay, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say anything more, but he's trying to save Shi Lian. I'm convinced of it. Shi Lian calmed down, go search the area around Long Air Bay and find the best location to set up an array to conduct a ritual. Yes, sir. Wu Ming replied. Shilin closed his eyes, paused, and opened his eyes again, gazed at the black-clad lad warrior, frowning. How come you're still here? The location is settled. What about the time? The time? The souls of the dead cannot wait any longer. We must find a subject to curse soon without delay. It indeed couldn't delay for too long. After some silence, Shilin said, three days. Why three days? Wu Ming asked. 
For some reason, every time Shilane conversed with him, he'd get easily agitated. In three days, it will be the full moon. Unleashing the human face disease will then increase the power significantly. If you ask too many questions, just go. Yeah, it, it has to be Bai Wuxiang inside of him trying to be like, why are you questioning? What are you doing? Just do as I say. But no, Wu Ming is trying to like figure out what's going on and what to do. Wu Ming nodded and stood down soundlessly. Shilin closed his eyes again and covered his forehead with a hand, hoping to relieve this wave of headache. Just then he heard a cold, mocking chuckle from behind him. Having heard this familiar mocking laugh, it was as if all of Shilian's blood had frozen solid. He instantly turned around, and sure enough, behind him sat a white, snow-white figure wearing a cry-smiling mask, wearing funeral garb with expansive sleeves, his hands tucked in, watching him from the altar. The white no-face. Shilian pulled his sword and lunged, and that lunged, and that white cloth man ting caught the point of the blade with two fingers. He sighed, oh, just as I thought. This appearance suits you very well. If they didn't remove their mask, these two look exactly the same from head to toe. After a scuffle, the two white cloth men clashing against each other, no one besides themselves would be able to differentiate one from the other. White No Face easily evaded all of Shelian's strikes as he asked, Your Highness, you buried your parents in such a deserted, strange soil. Don't you think it wronged them? Shelian's heart sank. You touched the bodies of my father and mother? Did you destroy their corpses? No, just the opposite, White No Face said. I helped you give them a proper, solemn burial. Hearing this, Shilin was taken aback. And White No Face added, I helped you carry them to the Shanla Royal Mausoleum. And I even helped them put on a rare and exquisite robes to prevent their cadavers from rotting for thousands of years. So the next time when you go visit them, you'll still be able to see the same faces from when they were still alive. He told Shelia the location of the royal mausoleum and the way to enter. This should have been something the king and the Goshi would tell Shelia personally, but before they were able, they either died or disappeared. Shelia was stunned and suspicious. Why do you know the way to enter the royal mausoleum? White No Face smiled. I know everything about your highness. You don't know shit. What is happening? He was still not used to spitting out vulgar words from his lips. As if White No Face had seen through his mind, he looked him up and down and said gently, Oh, don't worry. It's all right. From now on, there will no longer be anything that can hold you back. There won't be anyone who holds any unnecessary expectations of you. And there certainly won't be anyone who'd know just who you are. So you can freely do anything you want to do. Hearing this, bafflement began to fill Shilian's mind. Just why was this monster here? To express goodwill. That's right. While that might sound hilarious, Shilian's instincts told him that this creature was here to express his goodwill. Whether it be providing his parents with a solemn burial or encouraging him, it all came from this intent. He must be very, very happy, happier than any other time Shilian had met him. It was as if seeing such a Shilian made him exceptionally delighted and he unconsciously became more gentle and kind. This kindness actually gave Shilian a flashing sense of gratefulness that bring tears, but much more so there was disgust. Shilian said frostily, don't be too happy too soon. Don't think I will allow a creature such as you to remain in this world. Once I've wiped Yong in from the map, I will come for you and you'd best prepare yourself. The white no-face flipped open his hands and shrugged. I welcome you with open arms. Even if you come with the intent to kill me, I will still be waiting here for you. When you've truly become strong enough to kill me, you'll be able to succeed me. However, the smile under the mask seemed to have faded. Will you actually destroy Yongin? What do you mean, Shiling demanded. You could have made your move right now. So why did you choose to move in three days instead? Could it be you're hesitating when things are coming to a head? Could it be even with your kingdom fallen and your family dead, you still don't have the courage to seek revenge? Will I witness another one of your highness's failures? The word failure was stabbing his ears. Shillian raised his sword and lunged, but he was tripped, but he true as tripped and fell over. White No-Face snatched his black sword somehow, and his earlier gentle tone had become condescending. Do you know what you're like right now? 
Shelian grabbed the white, the snow white boot on his chest, but no matter how hard he pushed, it wouldn't move an inch. He remained firmly pinned down by that foot, unable to get up. White no face leaned down slightly. You're like a sulking child. You haven't yet the resolve. Who says I don't? Shelian cried angrily. Then what are you doing right now? Where's your curse? Where's all of your dead? Your father and mother, your soldiers, your citizens? How truly pitiful to have such a god be thrust upon them. You couldn't protect them while they were alive, and you can't avenge them even after they've died, you useless trash! He pushed down with his foot, and strings of blood instantly spilled over the edges of Shelian's cry-smiling mask, gushing from his throat. The white no-face dropped his hand, gripping the sword, and that blade j and that black jade-like tip prodded against Shelian's throat, drawing over that cursed shackle, awakening certain memories within Shelian. Would you like me to help remind you of what it feels like to be pierced by a hundred swords? <sighs> Overwhelming fear made Shelian's breath hitch, too terrified to move. After having scared him, the white no-face became amiable again. He withdrew his boot and helped Shelian, who was frozen in terror on the ground, to sit up grasped his chin and pushed him to look in a certain direction. Come look. This is what you look like now. What he made Shelian look at was the desecrated divine statue upon the desecrated altar. Who do you have to thank for becoming like this? He asked. Do you think it's me? It was as if Shelian's brain was forcefully washed by him again and new things were repeatedly pouring in making him more and more confused, more and more doubtful. He'd even forgotten his anger. He wondered bemusingly, what is your objective? What is your objective? Why do you cling to me? I told you, the white no-face replied. I've come to guide and educate you. The third thing I am teaching you is this. If you cannot save the common people, then destroy them. Only when you step on them will they revere you. After having said such words, Chilean's head suddenly throbbed like it was going to explode, and he clutched his head and screamed. It was those resentful spirits. Countless resentful spirits were shrieking and wailing inside his brain, and Chilean's head hurt so much he wanted to roll over on the ground. The white no-face, on the other hand, started laughing next to him. He cooed gently, I cannot wait any longer. In three days, if you don't unleash the human face disease, if you cannot give them a subject to curse, then you will become the one they curse. Do you know what you will become then? Shilling could feel the freezing black sword once again stuffed into his hand and a voice resounded next to his ears. You no longer have the choice to turn back. I'm going to talk about this! When that throbbing headache gradually faded at last, after Shilling dropped his hands and opened his eyes, there was only left him within that broken down palace of the crown prince. The other white clothed man who looked exactly like him had vanished. An unknown time had passed, and night had fallen. It was dim and devoid of light inside the palace of the crown prince. Shillian's heart stirred as he realized something. One of the three-day period had already passed. Just then, within the darkness of the hall, there seemed to be a touch of white flashing by. It was a curious appearance, and Shillian turned to look. But when he saw clearly what the touch of white was, his pupils underneath the mask shrank. He snatched that thing and demanded... What is this flower doing here? It was a fresh, tender, and weak little white flower placed upon the left hand of that burnt black divine statue with missing limbs. The contrast made it appear particularly pure like snow, but also particularly bleak. It looked as if this divine statue had landed all those injuries in order to protect this little flower. Shelian didn't know why, seeing this picture enraged him and he shouted ghost come out soon after the black clad warrior carrying a saber appeared as expected he hadn't yet spoken before shillian demanded what's with this flower who did this you did this wuming bowed his head slightly and his gaze stopped for a moment on the flower that seemed to be crushed to suffocation in shillian's hand before finally he said quietly it wasn't me then who could have done it shillian exclaimed why does your highness become so irritated when seeing this flower Shillian's face darkened. He threw the flower on the ground. A prank like this disgusts me. Wu Ming, however, said, Why does your highness think it's a prank? Perhaps there truly are believers here who worship your highness. Oh, 
my god. Oh, the oh my god, my mind. It's just befuddled. I ah, chapter 195. Nameless ghost offering a nameless flower too. Having heard him, she and felt as if he was slapped and he turned to him. Are you making fun of me? No. Then don't say such nonsense. How could there be such a thing? It's not impossible. Shilin couldn't take it anymore and snapped back. That's enough. What are you trying to say? Weren't you a soldier of Shanla? I didn't rouse you from the battlefield to listen to you speak for Yongin. You just need to heed my command. The flower on the ground pierced his heart and stabbed his eyes, making him feel unkempt all of a sudden. Oh no, Shilin charged forward and stomped it down, crushing it like he was venting all of this fury. Yet after he was done, he felt baffled by himself. Why must he throw up such a huge tamper, temper tantrum against such a small flower? He rushed out of the temple of the crown prince. It was only after feeling the cool breeze that he gradually calmed down. Behind him, the black-clad warrior followed after him and came out. Shillian asked, you investigate this area. Have you found anywhere that appears unusual? No. Are you sure? In order to unleash the human face disease, there can't be anything amiss with time, fortune, or location. I'm sure, Wu Ming replied. She landed nothing more to say, and he looked up at the sky. After a moment of silence, Wu Ming asked, Your Highness, have you thought of how to unleash the pestilence of the resentful spirits? I'm still thinking, Shilian said. He looked down at the black sword hanging off his waist. Millions of resentful spirits were sealed within this black sword, but could only keep them sealed for so long. Okay, so it's in the sword now, not just his sleeves. Just then, Wu Ming spoke up, Your Highness, I have a presumptuous request. Speak. I hope your highness would give me the sword and permit me to activate the human face disease. Why? The eyes behind the mask of that black-clad warrior watching him intently. My beloved sustained grave injuries in this war. Oh my God! Suffering a fate worse than death. I could only watch helplessly as they suffered this torment, struggling in agony. Oh my God! And, Shilian said, and so... I hope I could be the one to wield the sword and avenge them. His reason was very reasonable, but for some reason, Shilian found it hard to trust him. He narrowed his eyes. I find you rather odd. He turned around, circled Wu Ming, as he said coolly, Based on what I've seen, you don't look like an avenger entangled in resentment and hatred. To ask this of me, is it really so you can unleash the human face disease? While he might have said so himself, why else would Wu Ming request to unleash the human face disease? The nameless black-clad warrior bowed his head towards him. Your Highness, I wish for the deaths of the young and people more than anyone. Furthermore, I wish it to be by my hands that they perish. If you don't believe me, I can go prove myself to you right now. And how do you plan on proving yourself? The black-clad warrior placed his hand on his saber and slowly stood down. By the third step back, Shilian realized what he planned to do. He was going to kill to prove to him he had a vengeful heart. Well, stop, Shilian called out. He stopped. After looking him over critically, Shilian said resolutely, No, I will unleash them myself. The black-clad warrior bowed his head, and with the mask on, it was hard to tell what the expression was on his face. Shilian didn't care for anyone's reaction either, and he turned around. However, before that, I have something else to do. He raised that frozen, jade-like black sword and stared at the glistening blade in his hand. A peculiar light flashed through his eyes. The black-clad warrior noticed something was off and exclaimed, Your Highness, what are you planning? He hadn't even had time to stop before Shi Lian, the next second, had turned the point of the blade on himself and plunged it into his own abdomen. Oh my God, no! Ugh. The next day on the streets of Long Air Bay, the weather hadn't been great lately. Cloudy and gloomy with wind gusts suddenly blowing at, the, blowing at times and nefarious rains fell at others. Speaking of which, it hadn't been peaceful lately, no matter the place. There had been word that even the palace was caught on fire. The king and the crown prince both were down with illness to the point where they could where they could only grant audience to no one. It was chaos everywhere, filled with ominous signs, and the people couldn't help but grumble, feeling ill at ease. Only ignorant children continued to play and run around without a care in the world. A wave of gloomy wind swept past, blinding the eyes. And soon after, there was a huge boom and suddenly sounded from the intersection of the street. The figure of a man had dropped from the skies. The crowd on the street were all startled by this sudden booming noise and they looked towards the end of the street. 
On the ground, there was a human-shaped crater formed from the crash, and within the hole was a person lying flat, listlessly. Their hair, his hair strewn and messy, his body covered in blood so much that his white robes appeared particularly horrifying. All of a sudden, everyone on the street came gathering. Who? My heavens, where did he drop from? The sky? Is he dead? I, I don't think so. I think he's still moving. I can't believe he'd survive a fall like that. Wait, what's on his chest? A sword? Once the crowd was close enough, the people finally saw the person's appearance clearly. While disheveled, his face was handsomely clean and white. Only his eyes were gazing towards the sky and blinking, unlike the living. But he couldn't said to be dead, since he was still breathing, and the black sword pierced his abdomen, penetrating his organs, was still rising up and down weakly along with his chest. Just then, someone exclaimed in, in surprise, Wait, isn't this, isn't this, isn't that the royal crown, highness, the crown prince? Now that he mentioned it, everyone else started to recognize him too. It really is. It's the crown prince from the past, the crown prince of Shanla. I've seen him before from a distance. Didn't they say he went missing? I heard he ascended. Why is he like this? What's with that sword? Is he really stabbed through? It's scary. Enough of that looking. Let me through. Will, will you let me through? I've got places to be. This end of the street was an intersection with the roads heading in two separate directions. Since it was blocked by a crowd of people, the carriages that came afterwards couldn't go through. So everyone descended to their vehicles to check things out, causing quite the commotion. Suddenly someone called out, wait, he seems to be saying something. The crowd quieted down and everyone held their breath, listening intently, trying to pick up any voices. A moment later, no one on the outer edges heard anything, so they shouted, what did he say, what did he say? Is he trying, is he trying to make the array or what? The ones in the front row called, no, what did he say? He said, save me. Shelian laid flat on the ground, and having uttered those two words, not another sound escaped his lips. The people crowding around him all showed different expressions, with various reactions and various degrees of puzzlement. A chubby man who looked to be a chef said, Save him! How do we save him? Someone took a guess. He probably meant to help pull the sword out. The chef looked fairly gusty, gutsy, and was about to go up and give him give it a shot when he was instantly held back by several hands. Oh, don't, don't, don't! Absolutely do not! Why not? You mustn't! Haven't you heard? Didn't Sean lose the war? Why did they lose the war? Because of the human face disease. Why was there the human face disease? Because there was a god of misfortune. And that's god of misfortune, really. The moment those words came out, no one dared to step up recklessly any longer. And all around that enormous human-shaped pit was suddenly empty of people. After all, no one knew just what happened to the crown prince of the previous dynasty. Was he a god of misfortune? Would they contract the horrifying face disease if they came in contact with him? Or would they find themselves in utter misfortune? Besides, it appeared that even if they didn't pull the sword, he wouldn't die for the moment. If he could fall from wherever he fell from such a great height and crash so loudly without dying, then he was beyond human. A moment later, someone said timidly, maybe we should report this to the authorities. Didn't they say this royal highness ascended and became a god? What's the use in reporting to the authorities? Then what should we do? The crowd chattered and babbled, but in the end, they couldn't come to a conclusion, so they still ended up sending someone to report the incident. Anything else was out of their hands. You want to lie there? Then just lie there. Leave him be. Thus, Shelian rested like that in that human-shaped pit, watching the curious heads of people gradually dis decrease and slowly disappear. The carriages that were blocked detoured around him, and children who were playing around on the streets were all dragged back into the house by their parents. There was still a person here or there who wouldn't pass, who'd pass by, but they were further away in the distance. Shelian remained expressionless throughout, speaking not a word. There was a little water seller who couldn't bear the sight and whispered to his wife watching the stall, Will it really be all right to leave him like this? How about I give him a cup of water? The wife of the little merchant hesitated for a moment and scanned the surroundings, whispering back, Let's not. If he really is a god of misfortune, then no one knows what would happen if you get too close. The little merchant was also hesitant, looking around, and a group of other merchants like him at their stalls were still staring at him, their expression nervous. As if he should approach, they would draw, draw their lines and stay far, far away. In the end, he didn't dare step out on his own and abandon the idea. And so, Shelian stayed like that, from the thin mist of morning to the blazing sun of midday. Then to dusk, he lay there until deep into the night. During that time, there were many people who saw him, but those who approached were very few, and there certainly wasn't anyone who would help pull that black sword from his abdomen. 
In the deep night, there was not a soul on the streets, but Shelian still laid there on the ground, watching the skies above. In the dark night, the stars twinkled, his thoughts wandering and mysterious. Suddenly, crisp, clear laughter sounded from above. <laughs> what are you doing? After so many visits from the owner of that voice, Shelian no longer reacted as violently as before. And not having received his angry and panicky welcome, the owner of that voice took the initiative to walk over himself and stood by Shelian's head, bending down, and his voice even seemed to sound a little disappointed. What are you waiting for? The half-crying, half-smiling mask was upside down and coincidentally blocked his entire vision. They faced each other with only a few feet between their faces. Shelian said coldly, get the hell out of here. You're blocking me from watching the sky. To be told to get the hell away, White No Face wasn't upset in the least. He laughingly straightened up, sounding more and more aff affable and like an elder who was tolerant of a spoiled child. What's so good about the sky? It's prettier than you, Shelian snapped back. Why the temper? White No Face asked. It wasn't me who stabbed you. And it wasn't me who left you here this time. You did this all yourself. Even if you haven't gotten the results you were hoping for, you still can't blame me. It's none of your shitty business, Shelian said. White No Face chuckled sympathetically. Silly child. Did you think someone would come and help pull out the sword? I'm going to wait till we talk about this. Man in Abyss receives a bamboo hat in the rain. Oh, Shelian doesn't have his bamboo hat at this point. He only used it when the Rain Master gave it to him, but we don't know how he got his bamboo hat. Oh, Shelian rebuked forcefully. I know no one will come, but it's none of your shitty business. The white no-face languidly asked, then why do you poke a hole to lay yourself in? Are you trying to get attention? No one will cry over you right now. Shelian countered, I'm doing this because I want to. It's none of your shitty business. If someone does come to help you, what will you do? And if no one comes to help you, what will you do? Shelian started cursing, why are you so full of bullshit? I'm going to throw up. It's none of your shitty business. None of your shitty business. His words became more and more vulgar and rude, his tone more and more agitate, aggravated, but as much as he swore, he only knew so many words. The white no face seemed to be very amused as he laughed out loud and then sighed, oh, you silly child. He turned around just as well. Either way, there's only one day left. Letting you foolishly struggle a bit is fine. Either way, no one will come to give you a single cup of water or help you pull back the black sword. Remember, the white no face reminded him, tomorrow at sunset, if you still haven't unleashed the human face disease, the curse will fall upon you. Shelian listened quietly, not moving a limb. The third day, Shelian still laid there in that deep, human-shaped pit in the middle of the intersection. Not even his posture had changed. The crowd today was too different. It wasn't too different from the crowd the day before. They all detoured far away from him, going about their day. Although the incident with a strange man falling from the sky had been reported to the authorities, when the other party heard that it could be the god of misfortune, that wasn't really causing any trouble, just lying there like a dead body, they didn't want to deal with it. And placated the affair with a vague, we'll observe for a few days. Who knows what would happen in a few days. Several curious children came running over, squatting by the edge of the pit to look at this man. They picked up a tree branch, secretly poking at him, but Shelian was like a dead fish without any reaction. They were amazed and wanted to throw something at him to see if it would elicit anything, but they were discovered by their parents and were harshly lectured before getting get grounded at home. The water merchant from the day before was also still glancing in his direction. Shillian hadn't taken a single drop of water for a day and a night, and a layer of dried and withered dead skin formed on his lips. The merchant felt sorry and ladled a bowl of water, seeming to want to deliver it, but his wife elbowed him, making him topple over the bottle, Bowl, and so he had to relent. Who knows if the heavens also wanted to join in on the fun. And after a midday, drizzling rain began to fall from the sky. The vendors on the streets hurriedly packed up their stalls, and the pedestrians also shouted at each other to hurry home, and they all left harshly, or hastily. After a while, the rain came pouring down harder and harder, and Shillian's face was scoured, appearing even more pale, and his entire body was soaked through. Soundlessly, the shadow of a white cloth man appeared next to Shelian. No one else in the street seemed to have noticed this peculiar fig figure. White No Face looked down condescendingly at him. The sun's about to set. Shelian was silent. You aren't the god of misfortune, but they would rather believe that you are, unwilling to believe that you aren't. 
Once upon a time, you defied the heavens and created rain for Yongin. Yet now they won't even donate a cup of water to you. To pierce you with a hundred swords might have been done out of desperation, but now they're not even willing to do something simple like helping you pull out a sword. They all found the task too difficult. I told you this before. No one will come help you. There was a voice screaming hysterically in Shilian's heart. Admit it. What he said is right. There isn't, there isn't, there isn't, there really isn't, there really isn't a single person. As if he had heard this desperate cry in Shilian's heart, White No-Face seemed to have smiled a bit, reached out and gripped the hilt of the black sword. But it's all right. They won't help you. But I will help you. Then he exerted some force, lifted his hand, and pulled that black sword from Shilian's abdomen, tossing it aside next to Shilian with a sounding clang. Soon after, the shadow of the white cloth in the rain laughed lightly as if he had succeeded, and he backed away, leaving Shilian to his own devices, and vanished. After having that black sword pulled out, Shilian's wound was exposed without cover, and due battered by the rain, the already numb pain started spreading once again. However, this was the only thing he could clearly feel at the moment. Splash, sploosh, splash, sploosh, the sound of a series of wild footsteps stomping on the water came, like there was a pedestrian who was running, rushing over in the rain. However, Shi Lian wasn't secretly hopeful like before. He sat up slowly, yet unexpectedly. Just as he got up, there was loud, ah, and a man fell heavily next to him. The man carried a large basket on his back and wore a bamboo hat for shielding against the rain. It was probably due to the pouring rain that he hadn't seen there was someone in the pit on the road, and only when he'd gotten closer and Shilian suddenly sat up did he notice. Plus, this man was running really fast, and so and to and to so forcibly stop, this tripping fall was quite heavy. As he tumbled and laid sprawled next to this human-shaped pit, he instantly started loudly swearing on the spot. Oh, what the fuck! His bamboo hat had flown off. The basket on his back was toppled, and all the white rice spilled all over the ground. The man sat on the ground and screamed in frustration, slapping down on the ground, and that wet mud and rice splattered on Shilian's face. The man was outraged, jumping three feet in the air, and he pointed Shilian squarely in the face. Oh, what the hell? This ancestor worked his ass off to earn a bit of money to buy a bit of rice, and now it's all gone just like that. How many lifetimes worth of bloody bad luck is this? Pay me back. Don't just sit there pretending to be dead. Pay me back. Shilian didn't bother to spare him a look at all and planned to ignore him. However, the man was unrelenting and he grabbed Shilian by the collar. Are you asking for death, huh? I'm talking to you. Yes, Shilian replied coldly. The man clicked his tongue. Well, if you want to eff and die, then go scamper off to the side and die on your own quietly. Why are you blocking the wo Why are you blocking people's way in the middle of the road? Can't you even die at peace? What a nuisance. Shilian let himself be shaken wildly by the collar, stoic and expressionless, exceedingly numb. Cuss. Cuss all you want. Nothing matters anymore. So just cuss however you want. Either way, everything will soon disappear. The sun was about to set. That man gripped the wooden Shilian, pressing to have Shilian pay him back. And when Shilian didn't respond, he cussed to his heart's content, but still wasn't appeased. Only after having pushed and shoved for a long while did he pick up his bamboo hat on the ground, put it over his head, and walked away grumbling. Shilian was thrown back into the pit with a dull thud, and gradually... He began to hear a clamoring noise, louder than the sound of the rain. It was the shrieking of millions of souls of the dead sealed within the black sword. Along with the setting sun sinking bit by bit down the west, they started hollering and wailing like mad inside Shelian's head, cheering and rejoicing for the coming arrival of their freedom and revenge. Shelian raised a hand and covered his face. Just as his hand was shakily reaching out to grab hold of that black sword on the ground, he noticed something strange. The rain seemed to have stopped. No, the rain didn't stop. It was something placed over his head, helping him block off that pouring rain. Shilian whipped his head to look up and saw someone crouched before him, pressing that bamboo hat that was on his own head onto Shilian's head. It was the man who was just cussing loudly at him. He glared at the other, and the other also glared back at him. What are you looking at me like that for? What? It was just some cussing. You really want to go die over it? He spat on the ground as he spoke, looking so miserable like you're crying for the dead. How unlucky. The man was savage and aggressive earlier, and now he seemed to feel a little guilty thinking back on it. After grumbling, he started to explain himself. All right, all right, it was my bad earlier. But you deserved all that scolding. 
told you to go all mental? Besides, who's never been cussed at before? Shillian's eyes were round and bulging and able to speak. The man grew impatient. Fine, 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 fine. It's my bad luck today. You don't have to pay back the rice. What are you doing still lying around for? You're a grown man, not a child. What are you waiting for Mom and Pa to pick you up? Get up, get up, get up. He urged as he pulled and yanked, pulling Shelian up and forcefully slapped him twice on the back. Stand up, go home now. And so, Shelian was pulled out of this human-shaped pit just like that and almost tumbled to the ground by those two slaps, feeling dumbfounded. When he snapped out of it, the man had already gone. What remained was only that bamboo hat still on his head, reminding him he was just pulled out by someone. It wasn't a hallucination. Who knows how much time had passed and the white no-face reappeared behind him. This time, he didn't smile, and his voice wasn't that easy and carefree anymore, but rather vaguely displeased and worried. What are you doing? Oh my god! The rain was still pouring down, but Shelian was wearing a bamboo hat given to him by someone. So while his body was already drenched, at least his head and face were now spared, but still his cheeks were wet. Seeing that Shelian wasn't answering, the white no-face added darkly, The sun is about to set. Take up your sword, otherwise you know what will happen. Shelian didn't turn his head back. He only said softly, Fuck you. What did you say? The white no-face's voice carried a trace of frost. Shelian turned to him and said calmly, Did you not hear me? I'll say it again. Suddenly, his leg flew out violently, thunderously kicking out, and suddenly sent the white no-face flying meters away. His foot stopped down. Shelian held his wound with one hand while the other pointed at the direction of the white no-face had gone. He used his loudest voice, giving everything he had to yell, I said, fuck you! Who do you think you are? You dare talk to me like this? I am the crown prince! Upon his face, two lines of tears were already streaming down from his eyes. Just one person, just one, really, just one person was enough. Oh my God! <laughs> Chapter 197, the man in the abyss receives a boo, bamboo hat in the rain, too. The white no-face was sent flying by his kick, and he flipped in the air and landed steadily. He yelled, are you mad? He was outraged. After so long, it was the very first time Shelian had witnessed such an intense emotional reaction from this creature, and that made him extremely pleased. He grabbed the black sword that was on the ground and charged forward. I'm not mad. I've just returned. That kick earlier was unanticipated, but now the attacks falling wouldn't be as easy. White No-Face dodged as he cried frostily. Have you forgotten how your parents left you? How your people treated you? How your worshippers betrayed you? Just this man, this puny, insignificant passerby. Now you've forgotten everything? I haven't forgotten, but... Shillian swung his sword and shouted angrily and vigorously. It's none of your shitty business! White No-Face seized the tip of the sword, gripping it exceedingly firm. Blood dripped, his knuckles cracking. He was losing it a little and muddled and muttered incredulously, you useless trash, you useless trash. You're truly useless trash. Having come this far to this point, you can actually regret, you can actually turn back. Shillian was also pressing down the sword, replying with gritted teeth, you disgust me. So I refuse to ever become something as disgusting as you. The white no face seemed to have calmed down a little and recovered the tone of his voice that sounded as if everything was within his control. Never mind. This is only your last bit of struggle in the face of death. Have you forgotten what I told you? Shelian panted a breath and White No-Face enunciated each word. The souls of the dead of the battlefield were summoned back by you. Now it is too late. They will not be stopped. Amidst the heavy rain, the black sword in Shelian's hand emitted a sharp ringing cry, stabbing his ears and head with pain. What will you do? White No-Face asked. Is it worth it? To take on the curse of 10,000 lifetimes for those people. Ever since that kick earlier, Shelian's blood was boiling through his veins and rushing to his head. All the sword swinging and the words he spat came straight from the heart without a thought of what should be done or anything that came afterwards. Now that he'd heard the white no-face's question, he didn't know how to answer either. You won't see what I plan to do, but before that, I'll get rid of you. The white no-face humped coldly. How arrogant. Then Shelian felt his body go light and his entire person was sent flying. He instantly steadied his mind to find his center, but before he found his balance, the white figure flashed above and struck down forcefully. It was as if Shelian had become a ball of iron, being heavily slung out, and after a loud crash, he crashed deeply into the ground. 
If it was said Shelian had a three-part hope in his mind that perhaps if he burst out he could have won. After the strike, he was now more than awake. He couldn't win. It was too strong to him. This creature was overwhelmingly strong. Shelian never thought an enemy to be overwhelming. It was only those few times he faced Jun Wu when such a rare moment would flash before his mind. However, Jun Wu was genuinely strong. It was a power that was measuredly restricted, deliberate, and careful, the complete opposite of White No Face. In his strength, there was a malicious, encroaching viciousness and a murderous intent filled with resentment. So it only took one strike before Shilian understood. He would never be able to win against White No Face. Perhaps there was only Jun Wu who could match, be a match for this creature. But the him now would never be able to have a voice reach Jun Wu. A violent stomp and White No Face's snow white boot stepped on Shilian's chest. He said chillingly, from the start, it was your arrogance and your naive dreams that caused everything. Shelian could feel his organs twist and retract from the stomp the pain excruciating, but he still held ba back that mouthful of blood. No, it wasn't me! What? White No Face said unpleasantly. Shelian reached out and clutched firmly onto that boot, his eyes clearer than ever before, shining and bright. It's you who brought the human face disease. It's you who caused everything. White No Face humped, well, perhaps if you must think that way. Then he smiled. But you must understand that if it wasn't for your arrogance and defying the heavens, I would never have appeared in this world. I was born by the will of heaven. The flames in Shelian's eyes weren't put out by the heavy rain. On the contrary, they were blazing stronger and stronger. Stop thinking so highly of yourself. I don't need you to teach me anything. I can learn on my own. If you represent heaven's will, then something like heaven's will should be destroyed. Muffled thunder rolled in the horizon. Whirlwinds blew. White No Face's voice had dropped deeper. He said softly, I took the utmost care in teaching you, but you remain obtuse and stubborn. Crown Prince, I've lost my patience. Shelian coughed a few times and White No Face continued. However, it makes no difference. Either way, you have long since roused them, and now only the last step needs to be taken. Allow me to help you with this last step. Shelian was alarmed. What are you planning? The white no-face bent down and seized Shelian's hand and stuffed the black sword in his palm, forcing him to grip it and raise it to the sky. A flashing thunderbolt struck down from the heavens, injecting into the heart of the black sword's blade and reflected back. Thick and dense gloomy clouds started stirring. The sea of black clouds enveloped the entire sky of Yongin. Countless faces, arms, legs, and other limbs were rolling with it, as if hell was moved to the heavens. At the same time, the sun had set. Shillian laid on the ground, the rolling black clouds and a sky filled with the flashing lightning and the crying of thunder reflected in his eyes. The white no-face tossed him in the black sword, almost dropped to the ground with a clang. It was as if millions of horses were shrieking and howling from the clouds, the parade of the apocalypse. And all over the streets and alleyways, many were startled and came out to see what was going on and they all looked confused. What's going on? What's all the noise? What the hell? What's in the sky? Is that a human face? It's chaos. It's the ominous sign of the end of the world. Shilian was covered in mud and grime, and as he stumbled, he crawled up from the ground. He yelled, go home, go back to your houses. Don't come out. Go home. Run. The human face disease was about to be unleashed once again. Shilian was fervently waving his hands while White No Face stood on the side and chuckled softly. Shilian whipped his head around and glared at him in rage. The White No Face tucked his hands in his sleeves and said calmly and easily, why is so angry? Either way, you can no longer turn back. So why not just enjoy the sweetness of revenge? This is all done by your hands. Appreciate it wholeheartedly. You, you really think I can't do anything about this, Shelian said. If you have a way, then please go ahead, the white no-face said. Shelian sucked in a huge breath and picked up the black sword from the ground and walked where the crowd was on the street. Everyone recognized him as the crown prince of the previous dynasty, who'd laid on the street for two days, an unghost-like ghost, an ungodly god, an inhuman human. They all backed away in trepidation, and Shelian shouted, All of you, stop where you are! For some reason, while he was covered in mud and grime from head to toe at the moment, there was a strange aura and everyone actually stopped. Do you see those things in the sky? Shelian said. The crowd nodded unconsciously. Those things are the resentful spirits that will trigger the human face disease. Very soon, the human face disease will erupt again. The sea of black clouds was indeed terrifying. And without needing much more convincing, the crowd believed him and everyone was horrified. The human face disease, why has it come again? Could it really be? Somewhere, 
Some were at a complete loss. Some were turning around to flee. The majority of them stood where they were frigidly in uneasiness, waiting for him to say more. But Shelian had no more to say, and he only gripped the sword in his hand and raised it forward. The moment he raised the chilling weapon, the crowd jumped and instantly backed away a few meters in fear. But Shelian shouted again, Take this! What? Under the rain, Shelian was holding that sword up as he said darkly, As long as you use the sword to pierce me, you won't be affected by the human face disease. White No Face's smile faltered for a moment. A brief moment later, he spoke with a relatively calm voice. Crown Prince, have you gone mad? The people were bewildered too. Well, what are you saying? Is he crazy? Take the sword and stab him for real? What is he planning? The crowd babbled and muttered, and a sudden laugh burst from White No Face. Have you lost your mind, or have you had not enough taste of being pierced by a hundred swords? No, this time I'm afraid it'll be the penetration of a million swords. Open your eyes and look at the sky. He suddenly stopped laughing. And he said, pointing to the sky, these are the resentful spirits have enveloped all of Yongin. Which means if you want to save the common people, you will have to have all of Yongin stab you. And you will become nothing but a puddle of flesh within a day. How is a foolish method like this any different from you trying to defy the heavens and create rain back then? Do you think you can save everyone? Shillian turned his head back to him. If a day isn't enough, then let it take a month. If a month won't do, then two months, three months. If I can't save 10,000, I'll save a thousand. If I can't save a thousand, I'll save a hundred, ten, even if it's only one. The white no face exclaimed in outrage. Why? Shillian raised the sword with both of his hands and roared loudly. There is no reason why, because I want to, even if I'm told you. He turned his head shakily back. Useless trash like you wouldn't understand. Condescending disdain was too obvious and cut too deep. And the white no face raised his voice unconsciously. You, what did you call me? Shelian stopped caring for him and turned calmly to the crowd. Just one stab and everything will be all right. I won't die. You've all seen it for yourselves these past two days. However, everyone is allowed one turn. No messing about. You all must listen to me. If anyone tries to start anything, I'll blow up your heads. Trust me, one of my hands can crush a hundred of your heads. The right no face was incredulous. You, you useless trash who bring ruin to your kingdom. You dare to call me useless trash? No one dared to take a sword. No one dared to take the sword in Shelian's hand, but no one dared to flee either. Having been ignored, the white no face was sinking deeper in dark anger. He said coolly, very well. Then I will sit back and watch just how your obstinance will ruin you. However, no matter in the end, you've brought it upon yourself. I hope you won't fall apart in the end and come crying to me in regret. Having pushed and shoved back and forth, the black clouds in the sky were growing denser and pressing down heavier like it was going to collapse and the shrieking cries of countless human faces were like they were right by the ears. Finally, there was a father who was scared. He couldn't take it anymore. He dragged a child over and took the sword. I'll give it a try with my Zhao Bao. Um... People were actually still hesitating, and they all exclaimed in, supply, in surprise, you're actually going to try. The father really hesitated, but he forced himself and said boldly, but but he really doesn't look like he'll die. I, I'm, I'm sorry, buddy. I'm really sorry. My Zhao Bao. He raised his hand and covered the eyes of the small child in his arms, letting the child grip the black sword. White No Face didn't interfere and only chucked, chuckled mockingly on the side. Shillian clenched, clenched his fist slightly, waiting for the pain to attack in the next se second, telling himself in his head, it's all right. I've already gotten hurt so many times. I'll get used to this soon enough. Yet unexpectedly, just as the black sword was about to penetrate his gut, it was soundlessly knocked down by someone. Shelian didn't receive the excruciating pain he anticipated, but instead there was a loud and clear, You can't! He whipped his head to look over. The one who knocked the black sword down was the little water merchant. The water merchant was mixed in the crowd, and he seemed to be unable to take it anymore, so he stepped out. I say, is this really, this isn't a pretty sight. Do you all see that blot on his stomach? All bloody. Will he really not die? Even if he doesn't die, he'd still bleed, no? The father scrunched up his face miserably, but, but the water merchant's wife elbowed him secretly again in the crowd, but the little merchant turned to her and admonished with a harsh, stop elbowing me. If you have issues, we'll talk later. They turned back. Besides... We don't know if he really won't contract the disease if we don't stab him. So let's just not stab him blindly. But, but soon, just then the small child in his arms started crying and the little merchant immediately pointed, Look, look, you're making your son stab people and it's making him cry. Sure enough, the small child cried soundly and threw the black sword to the ground. He probably didn't know what his father was thinking either, but he was scared nonetheless. 
Thus, this killed any idea the father had in his mind, and he pushed back into the crowd holding his son. There were some who were ready to try, but when they saw the first person who stepped up was set back, the ones who didn't feel as brave either, they yelled from the crowd, Haven't you heard what he said? The human face is about to descend upon us. He's a god of misfortune. He brought this to our heads. But the little merchant countered, countered, Even if he's the god of misfortune, he wouldn't want to do this willingly. He kept talking and started pissing people off. You know he's willing, so what's the problem? Do you want everyone to die together? Well, just focus on your selling water. Shortchanging people on the regular. What are you doing standing out now? The wife of the little merchant kept elbowing him, but she heard... But when she heard that, she instantly exploded, yelling with her face red, Well, mother effing bullshit! Who's shortchanging? Come the hell out and say this to my face! The other party instantly shrank back, and the little merchant also flushed, but soon after he hardened up. He said, I say, whether he's willing is his business, but whether we act is our business. This is taking up a blade and stabbing people. If in the past two days I had given him water or something, maybe I could have given this whole thing a try, but I didn't. Who did? In any case, I'd feel ashamed. Man in the abyss receives a bamboo hat in the rain. Three. The moment he said so, everyone fell silent because he really hit the nail on the head. In the past two days, there wasn't really anyone who came to give Shelian a hand. This water merchant had at least had the mind to help, but he didn't make it. But the others didn't even dare to spare a glance in his direction. Someone grumbled, then what should we do now? If we can't do this, then why don't you come up with something? The crowd was about to get rowdy again, some even trying to push themselves to the front. Then another voice shouted savagely, Who's making all this racket? If anyone wants to get this rough, this ancestor's got a knife. When he looked, it was that chubby chef who was the first who, it was the first who wanted to pull the sword out the day Shillian fell from the sky. Something seemed to have provoked him, and he roared, That little buddy is right. If it wasn't several people holding me back yesterday, I would have almost pulled that sword out. And now, how come, before I even moved, you lot are the ones making the noise? Pathetic! Think you're worthy? Well, you certainly don't see such shameless thick skins every day. But the chef was a big man, his voice loud and clear, and he was in the height of his anger, a butcher knife in his hand. As if he only had just came out of the kitchen, the ones who were complaining the loudest earlier instantly didn't dare to make any more noise. And there were those who didn't know what had happened the past couple of days, and after they inquired, they were all surprised. No way, none of you went up to help? Yeah, you all just left him lying there for two days? You didn't even help him sit up or anything? The more they spoke, the more the others felt ashamed, and they countered, Well, don't speak as if you would have gone up to help and say all those pretty things after the fact. Don't forget when these ghastly things descend later, none of us will get away. And I'll tell you, if I was there... I definitely would have helped him pull out the sword. Of course, it's easy moving your lips after the whole thing is over. Wait, why are you guys arguing over this? Pulling the sword isn't the problem right now. As they argued, both sides were rambunctious and unruly, a brawl waiting to happen, and the rain also had slowly stopped. But those black clouds were growing thicker, the pressure so dense it was suffocating the hundreds of people below. Suddenly there was a scream that exploded from within the crowd and many fingers pointed at the sky. It's coming! Shillian's head also shot up. Those human faces rolling within the black clouds suddenly started surging, and they rapidly plunged down like black shooting stars, dragging long tails behind them. The human face disease was coming. The crowd was petrified as they had lost themselves. Some bolted, some went to hide inside their houses, and there were also a few who went to grab for the black sword. However, the black sword that was knocked from the ground had vanished since who knows when, and they came up empty. Shilian was also shocked by the people's reactions. He exclaimed, where's the sword? Who took it? No one had the time to answer, since everyone was fleeing in all directions. However, how could they possibly be faster than the falling resentful spirits? Soon, all around, there came wails and screams of the living and howls of the resentful spirits. After those resentful spirits had been caught, caught up to the living, they were like rolling thick black smoke, unrelenting, unrelenting and clinging, entering through every pore, slowly melding onto their bodies. Shillian fought arduously, trying to drive them out, but alas... There were still too many resentful spirits, and he, and he alone couldn't drive them all out. He watched helplessly as countless before him wailed and howled as they were chased down by the ghosts. The little water merchant and his wife, the chubby chef who was rolling all over the ground, wrestling with the entanglement of black smoke. All the while, the white no-face stood by closely, jeering unceasingly, watching it all. Chilean was both furious and anxious, and stealing his heart, he roared to the place that was dense, densest with the resentful spirits. Hey! He was the mastermind behind their awakening after all. And with this call, those creatures very naturally noticed him. Shillian opened his arms wide. Come to me! The resentful spirits that had already tangled up the living hesitated. 
undecided whether they should go over, but the resentful spirit still in the air instantly changed course and went straight for Shilian. Success! Shilian's heart was beating so fast it was going to stop. He didn't know what would happen, and he didn't know what would become of him either. But just by all the blood rushing to his head, he was going to give it his all. He felt even if it was only striving for vindication, and he got beaten black and blue, he would still never back away. Even if another hundred thousand souls of the dead were to come, he would still be invincible. If you want to see me feel sorry for myself and self-destruct, well, I won't. I will never. Swarms of the black tide that covered the heavens to the earth surrounded Shelian, and a resentful spirit wailed as it passed through his body. In an instant, it was as if Shelian's heart had frozen, his body shuddered. Soon after, a second one came, and a third one. The creature were like blades with sharp auras, striking through him, penetrating his body, and every time they'd take away a bit of the warmth that he had left. And Shelian's face grew paler and paler. Never, nevertheless, he remained determined and never backed away. It had only been a few hundred of them. He had only stood his ground for a bit, and there would be many more after. The entire sky full of black clouds were all them. Shillian closed his eyes, preparing to take on the flaming fury of all those resentful spirits by his own power. Yet unexpectedly, the next resentful spirit never came. Confused, he opened his eyes, and to his surprise, the black tide surrounding him had vanished. They had all transformed into a rolling black current and had been sucked away in a different direction. Stunned, Shelian turned his head to look. At the end of the long street stood a black-clad warrior, and in his hand gripped the long black sword. Wu Ming! Shelian had given him the order beforehand to walk away while Shelian activated the human face disease. So why would he appear here at this place in time? Shelian couldn't figure out what was going on and what the black-clad warrior was doing here. After being stunned for a moment, he immediately charged towards him running. He shouted, wait, what are you doing? Don't touch that! Give me back the sword! The black-clad warrior seemed to have heard his voice and looked up slightly. Shilling couldn't see his real face, only the mask with the drawn smile, but a strange feeling came to him. He felt beneath the mask of that black-clad warrior he was smiling for real. But the feeling was fleeting. The enormous black torrent and the screaming tide mixed together to form a tempest, and it gathered, swallowing the black-clad warrior whole in an instant. In that moment, Shilling heard a heart-wrenching, blood-curdling scream. He seemed to have heard the scream from somewhere before. He must have heard this voice from somewhere before. The painful, so painful as if he was feeling the same agony. It was so painful. It was a fate worse than death. So painful. Both his heart and body were going to be crushed. So painful. He fell heavily to the ground on his knees, hugging his head as he screamed along too. That explosion of excruciating pain in his heart suddenly came and left equally fast. After an unknown time had passed, silence slowly descended upon the surroundings. Shillian gradually dropped his hands that were hugging his head. Slightly dazed, he looked up and scanned the surroundings. All around the ground were covered with people, most of them unconscious. But all the resentful spirits entangling them had vanished. This feeling confused him. What had happened to the human face disease? What had happened to the resentful spirits? What had happened to himself? There was no trace of the black torrent left either. The only thing that remained where that black-clad nameless ghost had stood was the black sword that had fallen to the ground, and next to the point of the blade was a tiny, small, white flower. Shilling crawled up staggeringly, walked over and picked up the flower and the sword. He felt his face, looked at his arms, and he didn't feel anything on his body that seemed different, like he had taken on some powerful curse. Just as he was mystified, a sudden voice came from behind him, Ah! He turned back and the white no-face was standing behind him, his arms crossed and his tucked in his sleeves, his expansive sleeves fluttering in the wind. Shelian hadn't processed what had happened, but he felt a vague sense of foreboding. The white no-face glanced at him and started chuckling. The sense of foreboding was growing stronger and Shelian knit his brows. What are you laughing about? You still don't understand what happened. What? Do you know who that ghost is? A... a soul dead from the battlefield yes but at the same time he was your very last believer in this world and now he's no more believer did he actually still have a believer in this world it was a good moment before Shilling could squeeze out a few words what do you mean no more his soul has dispersed how did his soul just disperse 
because he was cursed on your behalf. The souls of the dead you summoned have devoured him whole, leaving not a crumb left. The souls of the dead he summoned, cursed on his behalf. Oh, yes, that's right. It also wasn't the first time you've met him. Shilling watched him in a daze. The white no-face seemed to be amused. This ghost seemed to have always followed you. At first, I only thought it possessed a rather deep resentment, so I caught it and interrogated it. Who knew the answers were quite interesting? The Zongyan Festival, the Lantern Night, a wandering ghost fire soul. Do you still remember? The Zongyan Festival. Lantern Night, the wandering ghost fire soul. White No Face lazily hinted, this ghost in life was a soldier under your command. In death, it was a soul of the dead that followed you. He died in battle for you, turned into a vicious ghost because you were pierced by a hundred swords, but also because of you. His soul perished by you, your unleashing of the human face disease. Shilian seemed to vaguely recall something, but he hadn't seen the face of his believer. He didn't even know his name. So what couldn't he really recall? How much could he really recall? Perhaps there are true believers here who worship your highness. Yes, there was. And he was his only one. White No Face seemed to have said so many other things. But Shelian was lost in a daze, taking nothing in until finally White No Face said, A god like you really is quite pathetic and laughable. And to be your believer, he's even more pathetic and laughable to the extreme. While he was mocking Shelian earlier, Shelian had no reaction. But when he heard this creature so condescendingly comment on how his believer was pathetic and laughable, it was as if Shelian was jolted awake by a stabbing sword. An uncontrollable rage rolled up. He charged over and seized easily, but White No-Face said coldly, You can't win against me like this. How many times must I tell you before you see the truth? Shelian hadn't wanted to win against him in the first place, and it didn't matter if he could win. He only simply wanted to beat that thing to a pulp. He cried angrily, How what do you know? How dare you mock him? And White No-Face replied, Why wouldn't I mock a follower of a failure? You're foolish, and your believer is even more foolish. Listen up. If you wish to defeat me, then you must obey my teachings. Otherwise, you shall never dream of winning against me. Shillian wanted to spit at him with everything he had, but even breathing was difficult. The white no-face flipped his hand and opened it, and within the palm, another cry-smiling mask appeared. Now let us start over. He was just pressing this mask onto Shillian's face when unexpectedly, right at that moment, there was a loud rumbling. In the horizon, lightning flashed and thunder roared, and a strange light shot out from the layers of the clouds. The white no-face was alarmed and stopped his action. What is this? A heavenly calamity? After a pause, he dismissed it. No, that's not it. That wasn't it. It was a heavenly calamity. But that wasn't the only thing. Oh my god! Oh my god! The voice of a man resounded deeply from the entire sky. If he cannot win against you, how about me? Shillian's head shot up. Since who knows when, a young martial god donned in white armor and brimming with, pr with pro proprietous aura had appeared at the end of the long street ahead. A thin layer of white spiritual light enveloped his body and he held a sword in his hand as he walked towards them step by step, breaking out a path of light in his gloomy dark world. Shillian widened, widened his eyes in spite of himself. June Wu, where the fuck have you been? Oh my God! What? After the rain ceased and the skies cleared, Shelian sat on the burnt earth, panting lightly. Oh, we don't get to see it! Jun Wu sheathed his sword and walked over Shanla. Welcome back to the ranks. He bore a tired expression, traces of blood still on his face left there by white no face. Other than that, Jun Wu was covered in innumerable injuries all over big and small. It wasn't that they were not serious, but White No-Face's wounds were more serious, so much that his body was ripped apart, his form dispersed, leaving behind only that shattered, cry-smiling face. Oh, we don't get to see it, MXTX! How dare you! How- uh, Only when he heard him say back to the ranks, Julian was taken aback. He felt his neck. And only then did he notice the curse shackle was gone. 
Jim Woo smiled. As expected, I was not mistaken. The time it took for you to return was shorter than I imagined. Shillian slowly processed the information, then he flashed a small smile too, but this was a bitter one. After catching his breath, he spoke up, my lord, I want to beg of you something. Permitted, Jun Woo said. Aren't you going to ask what it is? Either way, you would be asking for a gift upon return to the heavenly court, so whatever this is, it might just as well be a gift to you for your returning to the ranks. The corner of his lips twitched, and he rose to his feet, looking Jun Woo squarely in the eyes. He said with utmost respect, then pray, my lord, banish me to the mortal realm once more. Hearing this, Jun Wu's smile faded. Why ever for? He explained himself truthfully. I've committed a crime. The second round of the human face disease was unleashed by me, even though the consequences don't look too serious. Since only a nameless ghost had vanished, and perhaps in this world, there would be no one who cared for this nameless ghost. So in the end, the consequences didn't look serious. Jun Wu said slowly, If you knew what was wrong, then you are already in the right. <laughs> like it's that simple. <laughs> However, Shilin shook his head. Just knowing is not enough. If I made a mistake, I should be the one to accept punishment. But I committed the wrong. And the one who took the punishment for me was... He raised his head. So as punishment, I pray my Lord will grant me a curse shackle. No, two curse shackles. One to seal away my spiritual powers. Another to disperse all my luck and fortune. Jun Wu frowned slightly. Disperse all your luck and fortune? Then won't you be unlucky to the extreme and truly become a god of misfortune? In the past, Chilean would deeply, certainly deeply mind when he was called the god of misfortune and was very repulsed by it, thinking it was a great humiliation. However, he no longer cared for such things. If I am to become a god of misfortune, then so be it, as long as I know for myself that I'm not one. Once this fortune was dispersed, it would naturally flow to those who were less fortunate, so it would be a form of atonement. It will be very embarrassing, Jun Wu reminded him. It doesn't matter, Shilian said, and to be honest, it feels like I'm almost used to it by now. Although it wasn't something he wanted to get used to, but once he did get used to it, it really felt like nothing could harm him. Jun Wu watched him. Shanla, you have to understand that without spiritual powers, you would no longer be a god. Shilian sighed, my lord, I know this better than anyone. After a pause, he said a little frustrated and a little forlorn, People say I am a god, and so I have spiritual powers, but in truth, I'm not the god they perceive me to be, and I might not be as invincible as they wished for. Would a god be such a failure, wishing to protect my own people, but I let their corpses spread across the wild, wishing to avenge them, but the very last minute I stopped and abandoned the plot? White No-Face wasn't wrong about me being a failure. If I am no longer a god, then so be it. Jun Wu looked at him intently, and after a long while, he said, Shanla has grown up. <laughs> this should have been something Shilian heard from his elders. Unfortunately, his father and mother had no more chances to say it. A moment later, Jun Wu said, Since it's the path you've chosen very well, however, I will need a reason to banish you to the mortal realm. He couldn't just so casually banish a heavenly official like a child's game. What did they take the heavens for? In this regard, Shilian had an idea, and he said, My lord, it doesn't seem like we've ever sparred with everything we've got. Juno instantly understood what he meant and smiled. Shilian, Shanla, I am injured. I'm injured too, Shilian said, so we're even. If that's the case, I will not hold back. And Shilian smiled, his eyes brightening with the excitement of the prospect. I won't either. His Highness the Crown Prince was banished again. After the smashing and grandiose second heavenly calamity, the Crown Prince of Shanla, fierce and truculent, 
rampaged back to the heavens, and before even one instant's time was up, he was knocked back down below once more by the heavenly martial emperor. None of the heavenly officials could figure out just what was that man thinking. But Shilian couldn't figure out what the other heavenly officials were thinking either. Were they really that curious? Watching him day after day, disguising themselves as mortals to watch them, disguising themselves as animals to watch them. It had been days that they had been stalking him. Was watching a grown man carry bricks and mud really that interesting? Just as he still wondered, the foreman behind him yelled out, Newbie, yes, you! I'm talking to you! Get back to work and stop being lazy! Shillian hastily sat up and answered loudly, Oh! Then he picked up a ragged cattail fan and started fanning the flames. Before him, there was a small stove stacked upon several bricks, and upon the stove was a large pot of rice bubbling as if it was being cooked. This was a construction site where, where he had hauled earth and mud. However, the bricks were already being done being transported. Not far away were two newly built temples, and his task at the moment was to cook. He cooked and cooked, and just as he was working very hard, two carriages came hauling two very big divine statues. Shilian was absentmindedly tossing whatever in the pot and was stealing glances in the middle of work. The two divine statues were each carried to their respective temples. From the hall of the temple on the left came cheers. General Shan Jin is great. General Shan Jin is generous and kind. Shilian was speechless. To use generous and kind to praise Mu Qing were these devotees for real? Oh my god! But they seemed to have very good reasons. After all, everyone knew that Mu Qing ascended because he cleaned up all the remaining stubborn, resentful spirits in the old capital of Shanla. So to understand it as generous and kind wasn't unreasonable. In any case, everyone in the old capital of Shanla were all very grateful to him. Inside the hall of the temple to the right, the cheering refused to be beaten and they roared, General Zhu Zhang is great! General Zhu Zhang is brave and mighty! Shilian nodded. To this, he had no objections. Just, that praise might not hold true what, what, when faced with women. The devotees on both sides were screaming with all their might, doing all they could to win over each other. So much that Shilian's ears were hurting. He sighed, rubbing his forehead and thinking, why must they be like this? If they hated each other so much, wouldn't the problem be solved by not building temples right next to each other? The answer to that was, of course not. Because this area was the most bustling domain with the best feng shui, so the devotees of those two heavenly officials would never abandon such a delectable land just to avoid each other. Of course, they had to do all they could to steal each other's worshippers and disgust one another. It didn't take long before the devotees from both sides went from yelling to fighting. Over, over on this side, Shilian felt the timing was about right and started banging on the pots, calling out loudly, Everyone stop fighting and come to eat! <laughs> they were at the height of their brawl. Who had time to mind him? Shilian shook his head and opened the pot cover and the fragrance wafted for ten miles. Now he'd done it. The mob instantly started, stopped and started howling, What the F? What's that smell? Who's cooking shit? And it's shit that smells like the pot's bottom. Pot's bottom is a layer of rice at the very bottom of the cooking pot that's usually burnt. Shilian argued back, What? This is a hidden treasured royal recipe. The foreman came around and his hand covering his nose, his face turned green, and he exclaimed, jumping to his feet, Bullshit! What hidden treasured recipe? What royalty? You get the hell out of here! Don't you disgust people? Shilian compromised, Fine, I'll go. But will you please give me my pay first? Oh, you dare mention pay? Why don't you tell me, huh? You, ever since you came, how much have I lost in damages, huh? When it rains, lightning strikes, nothing comes only for you. Houses caught on fire three times and collapsed three times, too. You're like a god of misfortune. And you dare ask me to pay. Get out of here. Come back again and I'll beat you up. Well, you can't say it like that, Shilian said. You've already said all those things were coming especially for me, but nothing happens to everyone else every time, so I say you just want to escape your bill. Before he was done, the foreman and all the other fellow laborers could no longer take the smell. And they all fled, leaving Shilian in the dust. Wait! Shilian called out. He glanced around the two parties that were fighting were chased away by the stench. Shilian was speechless. Well, if you weren't going to eat it, why have me cook such a large pot? Don't waste just because you've not got the money. Shaking his head, Shilian contemplated, and he ladled two large bowls of rice, one offered inside the temple of Yu Zhang, and the other offered inside of Zhan Yu, of Zhan Jin. Finally, feeling that everything had served its purpose, 
He clasped his hand closed, completely satisfied. He went back outside to pack up his stuff, rolling up the straw mat on the ground very seriously and tied it with a sword with the sword before carrying both on his back. The white silk band wrapped around his wrist and nuzzled secretly and Shelly and patted it, riding the bamboo hat on his head. Fine, don't pay. I'll go busking. He still had a specialty trick after all, shattering boulders on his chest. As he walked down the path, Shillian suddenly noticed there was a tiny little red flower on the side of the road. Quite precious. He crouched down, gently touching its petals, feeling quite cheerful. He said, I hope we shall meet again. Even after he'd gone into the distance, the tiny red flower was still dancing in the wind. to June Woo, where have you been this entire time? I mean, there is a symbolic metaphor there and I am here for it and we're going to talk about it. And there, there are lots of symbolic things happening in these chapters. There are lots of things happening. It was just like a tour de force. It This, this felt like almost the climax of the story, but we know that's not the case. The climax is still yet to come because Bai Wusheng is back. Whatever the hell he is, he's back. And we're going to talk about that. But I, this almost felt like such a climactic moment. And then we have the resolution, which is that Shilian just went on his little merry way. But there's still so much with that. And oh my God, we still have, we still have to deal with Bai Wusheng in the present. The question is though, is... I, this whole discussion may or may not, once I get onto the chapters, it's going to be linear, but I got to speak my piece for now about some things. Uh, one, my big question is, is Jun Wu going to show up with Hua Chong there? Are Jun Wu and Hua Chong going to work together? Because they seem to be, Hua Chong and Jun Wu seem to be like on either side of the barrier for Xi Lian in, in many ways, right? You've got, if we're going to look at this and look at this hard, you have like on one spectrum, you have Jun Wu, who is this like idea of order, order, but compassion, right? Order, but compassion and certainty for Xi Lian. Like he, he says it himself. He's like, oh, I knew you would ascend again. I'm like, where the hell have you been this whole time? <laughs> like, but if you think about it, you know, I, I, I was like, WTF Jun Wu, now you decide to show up. But the thing about it is Jun Wu's always been like, he is stability. He is order. He is the king of the heavenly realm. So he's the emperor. He has to do things a certain way. So he's this stability and order, but he's always been like rooting for Xi Lian and wanting to help him for the sidelines and to get confirmation with the second ascent and descent that Shelian requested all of this and then they put on this they they did this act we'll talk about it but I was like ah it all makes sense it all just although the timeline there's some implications about that we'll talk about those implications here in a second but you have Jun Wu that's on this side of the fence for Shelian right on the other side you have Hua Chong who is basically like, it's just raw passion and devotion, right? It's just raw passion and devotion. You have Jun Wu, who is literally, like, it almost frames it as, like, two ships for Xilian, but at this point, I don't ship Xilian and Jun Wu. It's way too much of, like, I, people have planted the father-daddy image of Jun Wu in my brain, and I can't escape that now. Um, but also it feels like Jun Wu is like, oh, you've grown up, Xi Lian. So at that point where he's like, you've grown up, Shanla, it's like, yeah, you're definitely like a father paternal figure to Xi Lian. You're not a romantic interest. But he does have this order and compassion and it's very controlled towards Xi Lian. Whereas Hua Chong is just raw passion and devotion. Like Hua Chong sacrificing himself. And we, we, we knew it was going to happen all along. You knew it was going to happen all along. It was just coming down the pipeline. But... The way that he did it. I love that you had the same narrow alleyway. And on one side of the alleyway, you had Hua Chong sacrificing himself 
to save Sheely in, to save his gege, and, and just connect, com, like, absorbing all the darkness. And then you had Jun Wu on the other side that showed up, like, as this bright white knight shining this light to save him. So you had it on two opposite ends. You almost wonder if Hua Chong went and got Jun Wu somehow. You almost wonder if, if Hua Chong was the, was the beacon that got Jun Wu to come. Now, the big question at this point, before we dive into the chapters, is does Jun Wu know that that's Hua Chong? Does he know that the one who devoted themselves and sacrificed himself to save Shilian, that it's the same being? Has he known all along? But Jun Wu, at this point, Jun Wu seems like he knows the whole story. He's kind of like in a Pei Ming boat. He knows the whole story and he's just like, whereas Pei Ming is like shipping Hualien uncontrollably, Jun Wu's like, yeah, I'm not going to deny that my kid wants to date this supreme ghost, but he did sacrifice himself to save him, so I guess I'm going to let him live. But just be careful, Shilian, he's a delinquent. <laughs> you know? It just feels like that. It feels like the dad that's begrudgingly like, okay, kid, you gotta, you date who you love, but this kid could be delinquent. Watch out for him. You know, that that's the vibe that I'm getting now, now that we go back there. And then you have Bai Wusheng, which, what the fudge, Bai Wusheng, who has all of this, like, jealousy, jealousy and resentment towards Shi Lian. We'll talk about it, and Huggleberry wants me to throw this toy since I've ignored him the last hour of reading these chapters. But yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it, it's just, I get why Jun Wu obviously couldn't come until Shilian ascended again. And his ascension and descension, I guess we might as well just put it out there that the second ascension, the second ascension was caused by the human face disease round two. That was the great act. And oddly enough, I love the idea that it's literally also Hua Chong triggering it, right? It's Shi Lian putting up a fight against Bai Wu Shang saying no. And then it's Hua Chong absorbing all the spirits and the second coming of the human face. This great event, we said it didn't have to be something good or bad. It just had to be something great. This second coming of the human face disease was the great event. And since Shi Lian caused it, technically, since Shi Lian caused it, by gathering, by gathering all the spirits. Go lay down, buddy. <laughs> then, no, then he's like, I'm not going to lay down, a little persistent ghost. Then it's technically what caused the second ascension. And then the descension that we come to find out is Shelian just not accepting it. And I think that says a lot because, I mean, I'm not surprised at this point that Shelian was like, no, I don't deserve to ascend again. No, let's not go that route. I'm not surprised Shelian says no. Um, and now we know he takes on the cursed shackle. He takes on both of them. He's like, I want one to curse my spiritual powers, one to curse my, my good luck, which he doesn't have anymore. He has no luck or, luck or fortune. And I like that Junwu is respectful, but he's like, yeah. You, you really want to do this? And he's like, yes. So we'll talk about it more when we get to it. We'll, we'll talk about it when we get to it. But we're going to be able to, we're going to be able to check off a lot of these and reorganize, which is a lot of fun. I'm like, we're finally getting some answers, but I still have lots of questions. I still have lots of questions in this, but oh my God. So we're talking about Shi Lian at the beginnings of this chapter. I, I debated last chapter about if Jun Wu or not Jun Wu, but if Bai Wu Shang was trying to possess Shi Lian. It seems at this point that Bai Wu Shang's mission was to, was to make Shi Lian into um, not only a disciple, not only a disciple, but to learn and take his place. Basically, Bai Wu Shang is Palpatine from Star Wars. Basically. He's like, I want you to basically learn everything from me. He wanted to make Shi Lian into Darth Vader, essentially. He was basically saying, Bai Wu Sheng was like, I want you to be my Darth Vader. I want you to be my, my disciple, my apprentice. Learn everything from me. Become like me. Wear the mask and the garb like I'm wearing. And be in the same mindset as me. And then eventually, along the way, he said, I want you to take up in the, in the English version, he says, I want you to take up my mantle, take up my place, be my successor. But the question is, was that really the case? Or was he just trying to take Shilian's body for himself? 
in Star Wars, the same thing is kind of implied, but not sure. So it's one of those, those situations where we as the audience may never know if Bai Wusheng really wanted his body or if he just wanted him to truly succeed him. Now, in the present, that's where that this question could actually be answered because in the present time, <laughs> which I'm so glad book four is over. I was, remember when I started out this video and I was like, oh, book four probably won't end to like halfway through book seven. No, <laughs> MXTX is like lies. <laughs> I'm gonna call you out, make you seem a fool, right? Because um, we just ended book four. I, I've never been happier to end a book ever. I was like, oh good, we're out of book four. But that means next volume, we are probably going to go back to the present, right? Or we think we are. I, I don't know. I'm curious about that. But in the present time, we still have Bai Wu Shang, who is trying to make Xilian remember. Now, <laughs> Bai Wu Shang, why you do this? I, I'm like, Bai Wu Shang, why would you try to get Xilian to remember all of these moments? Because this, this book ends happily. This book ends like, well, not happily, but it ends like bittersweet where Shelian accepts that he's not a god. He accepts that he's just a person. And he's like, I'll just accept whatever comes my way, but I'm not going to try to be something that I'm not. And he goes along his merry way and he's busking. And eventually we know he becomes a scrap collector down the line. But I'm like, Bai Wu Shang, if you showed Shelian anything, it's that one, Hua Chong has loved him all this time and protected him and is the one that's with him now. Why would you want to show him that? And two, you showed Shi Lian was able to get through the conflict. So I'm still a little confused at what Bai Wusheng's end goal is here in trying to get Shi Lian to convince to kill himself. It feels like Bai Wusheng and Chi Rong were both trying to do the same thing. They were trying to get Shi Lian to go down to his weakest point so that they could take advantage of him. And as we learned in the last flashback, that didn't work with Chi Rong. I don't think it's going to work here. My question is, are we immediately going to go to the present? Or in book five, are we going to spend any time um, retracing steps? That's going to be, we're going to update this here at the end. But are we going to retrace our steps? Like what happened? Because honestly, the second ascension did not happen that long after the first. It honestly happened like a year after the first ascension or four years technically. It happened a year after his descension the first time. So it was a really quick turnaround and it was 10 minutes till he descended again. And then it was nearly 800 years before he ascends the third time. So the reason why I was like, that's so messed up is because back during the Manwa chapter, a few chapters back, when Shilin was talking to Lan Chan Chu, Lan Chan Chu was like, well, you came to Yongin as a Goshi. And Shilin's like, yeah. He's like, I just descended. So I was having a really bad time. His just descended was 500 years prior to him showing up at Yongin. So I'm like, wait a minute. Shilin's like, yeah, I was just in a bad mood in a bad place for 500 years. Because that's what it's suggesting. It's suggesting that we had 800 years ago, we had the first ascension and descension, and then we had like 796 years ago was the second ascension and descension, and then like 500 years of Shelian just wandering around aimlessly before Yongin, and that was 300 years prior. So we have this 500 year gap of who knows what happened. And then 300 years ago was the Yongin incident, which Shilian tried to get involved, tried to jump back into the fray again, failed. And then we had 200 years, 100 years passed, where he was supposedly 100 years passed, where there was the coffin incident. Now, it's not been confirmed whether Shilian was in that coffin for 100 years or so. Um, it's been kind of spoilery hinted at in the Discord, so I don't know if that's true or not, but we'll find out. And then Banyu was 200 years ago, and that was the whole General Hua thing. So in General Hua, we had the Goshi situation, and then we had a uh, scrap collector. Scrap collector, uh, Shilian, for 200 years, and then he is third ascension. For whatever reason, we don't know why Shilian ascended a third time. I 
I don't know. That's that. That is the one thing. Is Shelian's third ascension? It's like he just ascends. But so far, his first ascension was defeating this god or this ghost. The second ascension was literally a human face disease, and the third ascension was just eh. <laughs> I don't know, right? So we're gonna put the third ascension um, on our radar because why did Shelian ascend a third time? And that seems to be the catalyst for all of this stuff happening now. Why? Why did it happen? So now instead of the second ascension, we're going to have the third ascent. <laughs> Basically, of, of like, was there a reason or was it just because he'd, he'd scrap collected so much that they were like, yeah, sure, we'll reward you. Seems weird. See, I'm saying the third ascension seems a little bit suspect now, especially considering how powerful the events of the first two were. I'm just saying. But yeah, so there's this 500 period, 500 year period of time where Shelian's just walking around being like, I guess I'll just sort my thoughts out and forget everything that happened during this bad time. And then he gets to, to Yongin and tries to do good and it just doesn't work out. So yeah, hmm. The timeline's interesting. The timeline is very interesting. And that 500 year period is a big chunk of time. But I guess if he just wandered aimlessly, who knows, right? Who knows? I'm, I'm hopeful that the seventh and eighth books will give us something. Some, the seventh and eighth volumes will give us some information, even if it's just telling us what he did over those 500 years. That's something rather than just being a mystery. But we'll see. But what's interesting about all of this is that, again, what is Bai Wusheng's goals? We'll get to that. But the sad thing is, is that Shi Lian, he's so frustrated because you can tell throughout these chapters, which I'm glad because the last set of chapters, Shi Lian did not feel like himself. That's why it seemed like he was possessed by, by Wu Sheng. He didn't feel like himself at all. And so it was like, well, is this Shi Lian or is it, you know, Bai Wu Sheng's influence? I think it's both. I think that Shi Lian was frustrated because of all the bad stuff he was hap that was happening to him. He wanted to express his anger. He's never expressed anger and rage like this before and disappointment and resentment. So it was him expressing these emotions for the first time. But it was also his frustration because even as Shi Lian's trying to be this badass villain, he's still Shi Lian. And so when he gets reminded of that, it's frustrating to him because he's like, he's trying to be something that he's not. But he's trying to, he's basically having a Tobey Maguire moment in Spider-Man 3 when he dyed his hair black and was like trying to dance around and be something that he's not. And Hua Chong is Mary Jane being like, the fudge. <laughs> it's basically what happened. So... I love that Hua Chong still is like, no, you are always going to be your highness. It's you, not the state of you, but you. And it's like, and Shi the the part that hurt the most was, you know, he tells, it, it did hurt when he told Hua Chong he was going to kill him if he kept up with it. And I was like, no, you're not. And then he's like trying to say it's going to be three days before they do the human face disease, but he's just trying to buy time. As soon as the white no face showed up and started questioning Shi motives, that's when I was like, oh, at first I thought that Bai Wu Sheng was like, no, it has to be on the special day that we do, that we unleash the human face disease. But then we find out, no, that was Shi Lian's reasoning. It had nothing to do with Bai Wu Sheng. So Bai Wu Sheng was just like, you're stalling. Why? Are you trying to think of some other option to keep from doing this? And that was the answer, was Shi Lian was trying to find any other option rather than unleash this on the people. Even though he was mad, even though he went to Long Ying with the intent to kill him, at the end of the day, he's like, I can't. It's just not me. It's not who I am. And I was like, ugh. So, and then the white no face just can't stand the fact that, that Shi Lian's not going along with him. What's super creepy about when he first comes to Shi Lian at the beginning of chapter 194 is the whole thing with the parents. Like Shi Lian had just buried his parents. And Bai Wu Sheng was like, oh no, that wasn't good enough, Shi Lian. He was like, no, I put them in a mausoleum and gave them these shrouds that they'll never decay. You can always go visit them. And Shi Lian's like, what is weird is how did Bai Wu Sheng know how to get to the mausoleum and the crypts? Was he in contact with Goshi? Did he learn these things? How did he know? Was he able to like, is he able to like inhabit corpses and learn from their memories? I I'm still like, what the fudge is Bai Wusheng? I'm still like, I don't understand. And I feel like, I feel like the answer of what Bai Wusheng is, is going to be something so simple. But it's one of those things that you're just like, oh, you're going to,
gonna find we're gonna find out eventually what I feel like in volume seven we're gonna find out what Bai Wu Sheng is. We're gonna we're gonna solve that mystery by the end of the story. But this set of chapters just makes you question it all the more, and you're like, well, how does he know these things about him? Is he an extension of Shelian somehow? He says he's the will of heavens. They sit down by the will of heavens, and I'm like, what does that even mean? So we have a lot of um, questions of what Bai Wusheng is. I don't want to know answers. Mm -mm. I feel like I'm close. I feel like it's on the tip of my tongue because he seems like he's an extension of Shelian, but he's not. But he clearly is something distinct because Jun Wu kills him, basically kills him. So I'm like, I, it's very curious. He's a ghost. And he's very powerful, but there's something else missing with his story that we don't know yet that we're going to find out in Volume 7, I feel. So I'm going to be patient and not question it too much and wait and see, because I feel like I'll drive myself crazy like Shillian trying to figure it out. So I don't want any hints or clues. I want you all to hold, sit on your hands, wait till I find out next volume. I'm sure I'll find out next volume. But it was very creepy because even when Bai Wu Sheng shows up amidst all the crowd, no one can see him. No mortals can see him. They can see Shilian because Shilian doesn't have spiritual powers and he's not a ghost. So that kind of is confirmation that Shilian's not a ghost because they can see him, which is good. But Bai Wu Sheng they can't see. And that was kind of like a creepy thing that messes with you too is that you don't, you realize that no one else can see Bai Wu Sheng except Shilian and Jun Wu. So it's like, what is happening? The fact that Jun Wu can see him too is interesting. So... I, I can't believe that MXTX didn't show us that battle. But I mean, what, what, what could they have said, right? What could you have said, right? We already knew the outcome of it. So MXTX is like, I just don't feel like writing it. <laughs> I just want to tell you the aftermath. And that is that, that is that Bai Wusheng hurt Jun Wu. So that should be noted. If Bai Wusheng can injure Jun Wu, who Xilin has never touched, both figuratively and in battle, uh, <laughs> then that should be saying something, right? Oh my God. But yeah, it is creepy that Bai Wusheng put the parents in the mausoleum and did that for Shilian. The way that it was written in the online version, it made it seem like Shilian took his parents to the mausoleum and did it himself. But that's not the case. It's just, it's a very weird moment. And it's like Bai Wusheng is trying to gaslight and like, whittle down Shilian to follow him so hardcore he's like but I did all these good things for you I like moved your family here and did all this like don't you trust me like Bai Wusheng is very much like a toxic relationship right it's very much that toxic Bai Wusheng reminds me of that toxic partner that will try to be like but I did these things for you I know I've abused you I know I've done all these horrible things they're basically like someone that's done domestic abuse yeah that's exactly like what Bai Wusheng is like. They're like, there's somebody that's abused their partner and been like, but I did these great things for you. Doesn't that make up? Shouldn't you just be with me now? Like, it, it's very toxic. It's very creepy. And it's awful. And Hua Chong isn't around at that moment to stop him. And then the moment that Hua Chong is gone, that's when Bai Wusheng shows back up, right? And they say, I'll welcome you with open arms. I'll be here waiting for you. If you become strong enough to succeed me. And at that point, I was like, I feel like him saying, once you're strong enough to succeed me, I'm like, that's when he was going to try to take Shilian's body over when he was at the height of his power. And like, if you kill me, I'll come into you or uh, whatever. Gross. Don't mean to be having our minds in the gutter about that. But he's like, will this become another one of your failures? And that is the thing too. At the end of the day, a lot of it is about Shilian's pride. And the whole phrase of pride goeth before the fall, right? That's been Shilian's thing. And even now, like in this moment, Bai Wusheng is like, well, are you going to be another failure? And it's just like a, a stab to Shilian's pride. And so he's just like, well, you know, what do you know what you're like right now? You're like a sulking child. You haven't yet the resolve. And that's a thing too. It's about pride versus resolve, right? Because up until now, in all of the chapters leading up to this, where bad things are happening to Shi Lian, Shi Lian's pride gets in the way. Like, it's his pride saying, I'm going to save the common people. And it's pride of, I can protect my parents. And it's his pride of, I don't need Mu Qing. I don't need Feng Shen. I can do this all on my own. And Shi Lian's pride just keeps getting in the way. 
even to the point where he drives Wachong away temporarily, where he's like, if you don't leave me alone, I'll kill you. I don't have any followers, whatever. Which is a sad thing because he does. He does have followers and he just doesn't want to acknowledge it. But Xilin's pride keeps being his biggest downfall. And Bai Wu Sheng inadvertently kind of, you know, points him in the right direction. He's like, you need resolve. What Bai Wu Sheng wanted him to have resolve in was the resolve to unleash the human face disease and become his disciple. But that's not where it ends up going. What ends up happening is that Xilin gets resolve to do what he wants and to try to do right in his mind and to him. Right? And he lets go of his pride. He lets go. By the end when Jun Wu like banishes him a second time, he's like, I don't care if I'm a failure. I don't care if I'm the god of misfortune. I don't care what I am. As long as I know what I am, that's what counts. He's like, as long as I have that self-love and I know what I am. And I don't know if self-love is the right word to call it because Shelian, it's so bittersweet at the end of these chapters. I'm glad that Shelian like starts to become who we know him as in the present. But it's so bittersweet. But at least it's better than him just hating himself, right? Because he hates himself throughout so much of this. And in the end, he's like, no, I don't hate myself, but... I'm going to take responsibility. And that whole conversation from the OVA and the Donghua and back in volume one with Hua Chong where he's like, Hua Chong's like, I don't understand why he gave you those. Because Hua Chong was gone at this point. Hua Chong was, was, you know, had been consumed by the human face disease spirits. He was gone. And so we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but he was gone. And so he was like, I don't understand. He's like, Jun Wu banished you. And Shi Lian, Shi Lian now saying that's the logic of a child it was, it makes so much sense now because it's Shi Lian thinking, oh, you don't even know the half of it. You don't even know why Jun Wu banished me because I told him to banish me. Like, like, Hua Chong doesn't know that. It's like the one time, the one like five minute span where Hua Chong was not reflective or knowing of Shi Lian, the one time was when Jun Wu banished him the second time. Hua Chong doesn't seem to know what happened there. Or if he does know, he has a very negative view of it. And Shi Lian's like, no, that was my decision. I chose to do that. I made that choice. It was all me. And he's like, me growing up was accepting that. And he's like, you're trying to defend me and that's cool, but you don't know the real story and you don't know the rest of the story. Right? So, so good to have confirmation about that. But yeah, by the end of it, Shilian's like, I don't care about my pride. I don't care if I'm a failure. He gets his resolve, which is what Bai Wu Sheng wanted, just not in the way that Bai Wu Sheng wanted. Right? So... The idea that the souls of all of these repressed, it felt very Little Mermaid-ish. Again, we've had so many Little Mermaid references with Bai Wu Shang and Xilin and Jun Wu. Jun Wu coming in like King Trident and taking out Ursula. That's what, oh my God, that's literally it. Like, Xilin becomes Ur, becomes Ariel, has three days to decide what to do or they'll turn back into sea foam, right? That's literally what happens. That That's literally what happens. Oh my God, this is like Little Mermaid where Xilin has three days to, to figure out what to do or they'll turn to sea foam, you know, it's like a mixture of Disney versus the actual, actual story. Um, and then Bai Wusheng is Ursula and Ju comes down like King Triton and just stabs it. And then Prince Eric ends up getting turned into sea foam instead is basically what it amounts to. What a great metaphor. <laughs> But yeah, so Shi Lian in three days decides that no. White No Face tries to say, I need to teach you a third thing. If you cannot save the common people, destroy them. Only when you step on them will they revere you. And that's when Shi Lian's head feels like it's going to explode. And it's the resentful spirits that are all contained that are starting to like bubble up needing a host to curse. So again, I feel like with that, it is reinforcing the idea of, of Wu Yang that by Wu Shang, he tried to save the common people himself. It failed. It led to his downfall. And then he decided, well, fine, if I can't save you, then I'll destroy you. And that's where Bai Wu Shang's been this whole time. Now, again, we don't know if this is the case for sure, but we'll see. But yeah, it's just mm -hmm, interesting. And just the idea of what do we do with all these revengeful spirits. And Shi Lian, again, it's like Shi Lian was willing to take on all of the pain. He was going to take on the pain from the ghosts entering him. He was going to take on the pain from the mortals attacking him with the sword. Like Shi Lian is just all about 
taking the brunt and self-sacrificing himself to save others. And now it, it's so painfully obvious why Ho, Hua Chong is like, no, I don't like you doing that. You still suffer in the end. I don't want that. And it makes sense now when Shilin was asking them to hurt him again. We'll talk about that in a minute. That Hua Chong was like, nope, I know you told me not to, Gege, but I'm not going to sit here and watch you die. Not going to sit here and watch you suffer like that again. I'd rather be consumed by the human face disease than watch that happen. So uh, the the hardest part about these early chapters, it wasn't Xilian threatening Hua Chong. It was him seeing the flower and becoming irritated. And Hua Chong lies. Hua Chong's like, it wasn't me that did it. It was him that put the flower there. I mean, if it wasn't him, I would be fine with if it was actually a, a devotee that put the flower there. But I'm like, no, you're lying. You put it there. You just didn't want Xilian to know. And it, it hurts so much when Shilian steps on the flower because it's right in front of Hua Chong. Hua Chong's like, you know, like, Hua Chong still believes in him. Even when he's going through all this bad stuff, he still believes in him and still has faith that the right path will work its way out in the end. And the sad part is that Shilian gets so frustrated and, and angry because he thinks that he thinks that it's mocking him because he's like, who would... It, it again, shows Shilian's lack of self-worth. He's like, who would worship me? Who would follow me at this point? He's like, I'm so far gone and I've done so much bad. Who would follow me at this point? And why should they? You know? And then he just can't see that it's Hua Chong. He can't understand that it's him. It's so sad, right? He just can't see it. And so, uh, and him crushing the flower. And then he's like, feels baffled. He's like, why did I throw this big temper tantrum over a flower? Which makes you wonder, one, if it's, partially by Wusheng's influence, but also that it's just Shi Lian feeling like, and this flower has represented Hua Chong's devotion to him this whole time. So I, it was so, this whole chapter was so bittersweet, this whole set, because you could just see the devotion between Shi Lian and Hua Chong. Like when, when Shi Lian's like, don't make fun of him. Like, like don't diss his memory. I was like, oh, like these two are such soulmates and they suffer together. Like whenever Shi Lian was on the altar the first time getting stabbed a hundred times and Hua Chong was screaming in agony for him. And then when Hua Chong is being devoured by the human face disease, Shi Lian is screaming in agony for him. It's like, just let these two be together, MXTX, which is what I'm hoping Volume seven will give us. I'm I'm just I'm just like okay. Let's just let's get there. <laughs> let's get there first. Ah. So, but I don't want any hints or clues of what's to come. We still got a ways to go. And so Shelian's thinking about how to unleash the pestilence of the resentful spirits. And Hua Chong, he he makes this request. He's like, let me have the sword. To activate it and I was like at the moment he said that I thought okay Hua Chong is gonna take the sword and he's gonna take on the vengeful spirits himself and he's gonna save Shi Lian and when he says my beloved sustained grave injuries suffering a fate worse than death and I could only watch helplessly as they were tortured suffering in agony and I want to avenge them which is what he wants to do he wants to he wants to ruin Bai Wu Sheng's plans he's like I'm gonna ruin Bai Wu Sheng's plans by taking this all on myself so that I prevent my Gege from suffering even more. Because you know, at this point, even though Shilian's trying to put on this front of being this stone cold hearted badass, at the end of the day, Shilian doesn't want to hurt the people. He says it, but then the more you follow his actions, it's like, no, he says that he's angry and he says he wants to do this, but his heart is still there. It's just, it's, it's like that little white flower. It's bleak and it's barely there, but it's still there. I love the idea of, of Shilian and Hua Chong represented by a white flower and a red flower next to each other. It's like freaking where the red fern grows. Like that's the saddest movie in the world. And the little red flower at the end just waving the breeze. I was like, ugh. But I'm not going to get off track. But he's just basically, he decides that he wants to take this instead of Shilian. And Shilian's like well who are it's like Shilian gets suspicious like well then why would you say this who are you and he's like well I'll prove that I'm devoted to you let me go kill someone and the moment Shilian stopped him from going to kill someone I was like mm, you're not really as black hearted as you seem to be and he's like I have to and that's when he decides I have to do something else and so at that point it's almost like Shilian is like no I'm gonna he realizes the extent that Wu Ming or Hua Chong is willing to do stuff for him. And he's like, no, before we get to this point, I have to do something. And so that's why he stabs himself, which 
Wooming is not about. And he stabs himself and stands in the crater like a god fallen to earth and waits to see if anybody will help him. Almost like Shelian is trying to prove, okay, do I, is everything really hopeless? Will no one help me? And if not, then I guess I'll just accept the human face disease and just be gone from this earth. Which is so sad, right? And it's so interesting because everybody, like, the idea that they see him and they question, like, it's that fear of the unknown and they don't really know what to do. And it's just all of their fear and prejudices are holding them back from helping someone. Which, again, is a big commentary on our own world, in our own reality. Because, like, when you see someone homeless on the street or someone suffering, a lot of times, a lot of times you don't help because you're afraid, like, are they going to attack me? Is something going to happen? Am I going to, you know, how is this going to affect me? We don't think of the other person, right? We don't think of them suffering. We just think of ourselves. And well, what does this do for myself by not helping them? I actually, I went to a conference yesterday and I was sitting with this woman. She was in her sixties and she said that she went to go visit her son and she went to a city and she, she's this, I mean, she's 60 years old and she has trouble walking. And she was talking about, how I could, I instantly thought of heaven officials blessing. And I was just sitting there with my hands like this, like, mm-hmm. and she was telling me the story that she was walking down the street and she tripped and fell and her suitcase like fell out of her hands. And she had a bag in her hand, her purse in her hand, and her purse spilled onto the ground. And she was like on, you know, her hands and knees and her knees got scraped and she was bleeding. And she's like, no one that you would think would help came up to help me. Like everybody on the street just walked past her except for literally, and I'm not making this up. This literally happened yesterday, except she said a homeless man walked up to her and a man that was selling water from a cart. And I was like reading these chapters. I was like, are you freaking kidding me? But I'm not joking. I swear on all things, holy and otherwise that she said that she was on the ground, her knee was bleeding and her purse was scattered everywhere and her suitcase was next to her. And this homeless man and a guy selling water from a cart came up to her and helped her pick up her things. And the homeless man had a first aid kit in his, in his shopping cart and went and got it and helped give her a bandage for her knee and helped her sit on the bench until she was able to collect herself and move on. But she was telling us that yesterday at this conference and she's like, you know, all the people that you think are going to help you that are good people, they just kept walking. They didn't pay me any, any mind, but the people that were, you know, that normally you wouldn't even think about like the guy selling water or the homeless man that you would be normally afraid of for whatever reason, she's like, those are the people that helped me and they didn't try to take my things. They didn't try to hurt me. They helped me and made sure I was okay. And then I was able to call my son and then he was able to come get me. And that's like, that's like this point here is that these people are all held back by prejudice and fear from doing something kind. And it takes this act of nature, this rain falling, which is irony upon irony, the rains in Yongin, the rain that Shelian worked so hard to get to come down to this land, right? It finally comes down and that's literally what saves him. Like, of all ironies, like, Nate, he calls, he says it's like heaven being cruel, right? It finally, like, comes down to him. And as it's raining, this man that was rushing tripped and fell and was like, what are you doing here? Why, why is this crater here? Why'd you cause this? Like, come on, what's happening? You know, I just, it's irony upon all ironies, right? That it happens. And I like that they, the people outside the crater are like, well, let's just report this to the authorities. And then they just don't do anything. They're like, we'll come back in a couple days. Again, mirroring reality. But like showing like the kids being curious and wanting to help and the parents taking them away. Like it's all, MXTX uses this part of the chapter to mirror our society so well. And it just makes you want to scream for like the water merchant to be able to go up and help him. And he comments on that later. And it's like, you know, if you hadn't elbowed me, honey, I could have gone and helped him sooner. But then... Then, as Shillian's sitting there, the white no face shows up before the water merchant. I love that Shillian, as he's whole, he's like, I'm prettier than you are. <laughs> like, they look exactly the same, supposedly. And it's just like, uh, he's like, it's none of your business. Let me do what I want. I'm trying to use every ounce of my being to prove that, that you're wrong and that I, that, that someone will help me. <laughs> Ruby got tired of Huckleberry playing with me. And then White No Face says, do you think someone would come and help you pull out that sword? 
No one's going to help you. But then he says, but I will help you. And he's like, I'll help you. And then he pulls the sword out. And he's like, you silly child. Tomorrow at sunset, if you haven't unleashed the human face to see, the curse will fall upon you. And Shelian, at this point, I think it accepted that that was going to happen. I think by this point, Shelian was like, I know, but I'm going to do my best to not unleash this human face disease because I don't want to hurt these people. Even though I'm mad, I it's like Shelian realized where his anger was going towards and was like, no, nah, I'm just going to do this myself. And so no one's going to come and help you. And Shelian, like a voice in Shelian's heart is screaming that there isn't a single person going to help him. It's like Bai Wusheng just whittles him down to the lowest point and just trying to get him in like this toxic environment where sure, it sounds like nobody's going to come and help, but, but again, like nothing is set in stone, right? And then as he pulls out the sword, Shelian is like about to grab it and start the human face disease. And that's when the guy falls into the pit. Like it's so interesting because he has the bamboo hat and it's during the rain. So there's all these callbacks to the rain master and to what happened like back in the earlier volume that you almost wonder like what act of fate led this man to fall in the pit with Shelian? Was it just fate or was it just random happenstance? We don't know. But he gives, but he, and the thing about it is he yells at Shelian and Shelian just like accepts it. Shelian doesn't fight back, right? He doesn't argue with him. He doesn't fight back. He's not violent. He just takes it and then like puts his hand over his head like he's accepted his fate and that he's going to take the black sword and kill himself essentially. And that's when the man comes back. And that whole scene, like I, I wanted to cry where he was just being like, he's like, fine. It's like the guy gets mad and he vents. And he's like, well, you know what? Actually, it was kind of my fault. I'm sorry. Like, it, it's fine. I yelled at you, but I shouldn't have. But why are you, why are you lying down? Get up. Come on. And he helps him up. And it's like one person. It wasn't a hallucination. He had the bamboo hat on. The man gave him his hat. It, it's just, it's this really beautiful moment where it's like, yeah, bad things happen. People get in arguments. People blame each other for things. And they yell and say things that they shouldn't have. And they create these scenarios that seem like they're so hopeless. But it's not the end of the world. And there is still kindness even amongst that. It's like every argument Shilian's had the past several chapters, he's had the argument with Mu Ching and Mu Ching left. He had the argument with Feng Shen and Feng Shen left. He had the argument with his parents and his parents left. He had the argument with Hua Chong and Hua Chong like didn't leave, but he left, right? Left to go get things ready to, to do, to take on the human face disease. And so Shili and everybody that he's had an argument with has just left him. But finally, this one guy proves to him like, no, look, I had an argument with you, but I'm not leaving here. Take that and go. That's all Shelian needed. And that, that line where Shelian, the rain is pouring down, his hands and face were not getting wet, were not getting rained on, but his cheeks were wet because he was crying. He was like, all he needed was proof that there was one person out there that would, that would stand up for him. That's all he needed was that he wasn't alone. Ugh. I don't think the man in the bamboo hat is Hua Chong because he, he curses at him, right? But... Him turning, Shilin turning around and telling Bai Wusheng to F off was just so cathartic. It was like, it was like all this, all this had been like building up inside of me. And I was like, Shilin, you just need to tell Bai Wusheng off. And he finally says, I am the crown prince. Like, I am God, you know? Oh, it's so, it's so, it just, it was so satisfying. So satisfying, right? And he finally kicks the white no face away. Now, granted... He's in no state to fight the white no face at all, but he's like two lines of tears were streaming down his eyes. One person, just one person was enough. That's all Shelian needed was to know that one person was okay with him and that was defending him. That's all he needed. And then, and then when we translate that to like one person is Hua Chong, that's why I need in book seven in volume seven, Book five, I need Hua Chong to show up and be like, I'm the one person that I'll always be there for Shilian. That's all I need. That's all I need. I need Hua Chong to show back up in Shilian's life so badly. I, I want them to kick Bai Wusheng's ass so badly. I really do. Ah, uh, I just, you know. And so then the white no face getting mad 
is really good. The white no face being like, are you insane? Like, and she leans like, no, I've returned. He's like, you almost got me. He's like, he's like, you almost had me. You had my sanity whittled down. You had me down on like one knee ready to submit to you. But he's like, no, that's not who I am. It's none of your business what I do. I don't have to learn from you. You're useless trash. And you disgust me. And what's interesting is that Bai Wusheng, he reacts kind of like Qi Rong, where the moment you call him useless trash, he's like, oh no. Like, no. Like, that is the one thing that Bai Wusheng can't stand is being called trash. Which is interesting, because it's very similar to Qi Rong, right? So, I'm so curious about his identity. I want to know, but I know that we're going to find out, so I can be patient. I can, I can be patient. But the souls of the dead were summoned by you. And now they won't be stopped. So yeah, it was like, basically, Bai Wusheng was wanting Xi Lian to get to this point where he would have summoned the souls up. And that's, we know that the souls of the dead were what caused the human face disease the first time. So him summoning them all back up again was going to bring about the second wave of it. And he's like, what are you going to do? If you can't get rid of them, they're going to have to go to somebody. And Xi Lian's like, fine. Then I'm going to have everyone here stab me. And fine, if that's what it takes to beat you. And the moment he said that there was only Jun Wu that could be a match for him, but right now, but the him now would never be able to have his voice reach Jun Wu because he's not ascended. And it's like, at that moment he mentioned Jun Wu, I was like, I was like, please let Jun Wu show up. And he does, right? But I'm just like, and at least now we get confirmation that Shi Lian, his voice wouldn't reach him because he was a mortal. And he didn't have the ability to have that happen. So at least it makes sense. It wasn't until he ascended that his voice could reach Jun Wu. But oh my god. And then he's like, it's you who brought the human face disease. You caused everything. And White No Face doesn't seem too bothered by it. He's like, if it wasn't for your arrogance and defying the heavens, I wouldn't have appeared in this world. I was born by the will of heaven. And she lands like, don't think so highly of yourself. If you represent heaven's will, then something like heaven's will should be destroyed. So that is, that is interesting. I We know Bai Wusheng's death at this point. We know that. But I want to know more about his identity. Like, and this ties back to who the prince is. Bai Wusheng, I want to tie to his identity. Because he says that he is heaven's will. Which is interesting. So if he was heaven's will, he's like, I took utmost care in teaching you. He's like, I've lost my patience. And it's so interesting. Because I'm like, if he's heaven's will, like that can mean a number of things. Does it mean that Bai Wusheng was Bai Wusheng sent as an executioner? Was he, was he sent down by the heavens to punish those who do wrong? And maybe in the past during, during Wu Yang, was he sent, was he originally the crown prince, but then in the heavens, he became this punisher. And then did he decide to defy the heavens and save the people of Wu Yang instead? And it all went awry and caused his downfall. And now he's trying to like act as this vengeful scythe to weed out those that would try to do the same that he had done. I mean, that seems like a very ghostly thing to do. So if he is in fact heaven's will and he's like an executioner, that went awry. That's kind of a cool idea. I don't know. We'll find out. <laughs> but that could very well be. And then Shi Lian decides that he's like, stop where you are. He's like, I'm going to have you basically stab me. And Bai Wusheng is like, but you've tried this the first time. But now you can tell Bai Wusheng is a little bit scared. Because before, the prospect of all of these swords piercing Shi Lian scared Shi Lian. And it created this resentful energy. But now Shilian's Tay, he's transformed this pain and turned it into something he can control. And it's so sad because now Shilian's like, well, if you hurt me, it's fine. He's like, sticks and stones are no longer going to break my bones and words are not going to hurt me either because it's just like, in the words of Jinx Monsoon, it's water off a duck's back. <laughs> and Shilian's like, I'm not going to let that affect me. He's like, if it takes, he's like, even if I only save one person, then that's enough. And that gets the white no face to say, why? And he's like, there is no reason. If I told you useless trash like you wouldn't understand. And that gets by Wu Shang. He's like, you brought ruin to your kingdom and you call me useless trash. And Xi Lian's like, mm -mm. 
not going to affect me anymore. I love Shilin getting confidence in himself and confidence in face by Wu Shang. It just really sucks that it's at the expense of Shilin hurting himself, right? Which is why I think Hua Chong is like, I want to be there for you, Gege, because I want you to have this confidence that you have now standing up to Bai Wu Shang, but I don't want you to hurt yourself. So again, how we're going to go back to the present and deal with this now I, I'm so excited. It is, I, if it were me, I'd read it today. I'd start volume seven today, but I'm not going to, I'm going to, I'm going to let all this sink in and soak in for a week and wait till the Manwatch chapter comes out. And then I'm going to read the first set for volume seven, but it's going to take a lot of self-will. <laughs> it's going to take a lot of, a lot of cultivation and discipline to make that happen. Right. But just seeing Bai Wu Shang be like, well, you're going to fall apart and come crying to me at the end. And the fact that, again, the father was going to have his kid stab Shi Lian. And that's when the merchant finally speaks up and is like, what are you doing? And that's when the kid cries. It's just, it's the great idea of how to stop mob mentality. And it's like the mob mentality, you just got to nip it in the bud from the start like you just got to keep it from happening to that point if you point out the ridiculous of it ridiculousness of it from the start then you can stop it because the merchant's finally like this is stupid why are we doing this like he still bleeds he may be immortal but he's still feeling pain like is that right for us to do and who knows if it's actually going to stop anything and they're all like oh <laughs> it's like where were you the first time this happened but again the circumstances were a little bit different because at that point, the human face disease was already out and infecting people, and it created fear and desperation. Here, it's just a thought of the unknown, but it hasn't actually become a threat. So the people are able to kind of reason with it and think it over and realize, oh, this was a bad idea. Why are we doing this? And that's when Shi Lian decides to take on the human face disease himself. And being like, I, I love that he's just like, they all say, well, I'd feel ashamed if I hurt someone like this. And that's when the human face disease starts to descend and Shi Lian decides to take it on himself. He's like, I'll take it all. Now, hundreds of spirits fly through Shi Lian. Again, hundreds, like the hundred swords stabbing him from the humans. Hundreds of ghosts stab him. So, I mean, and the heavenly officials have all at this point kind of abandoned him in their own way as well. And so Shi Lian's like, I'm just gonna, he's like, you want me to feel sorry for myself and self-destruct? I will never. I love that Shilin gets his resolve and he's like, you want me to just like come crashing down and crumbling and groveling at your feet by Wu Shang and letting you inhabit me? No. He's like, I'll take all of this, even if I have to like sit here and suffer for hundreds of years, but, but I'm not gonna let you take me over. Which he doesn't. He ends up going for hundreds of years, suffering and being alone, but... He doesn't let him, he doesn't shake his resolve. But then the sky is full of black clouds and all of these spirits, the, the human face disease, and Hua Chong lets them. He takes the black sword, the long black sword, and he sucks it up. So the sword that Shi Lian gets at the very end is a sword that, uh, that Jun Wu gave him, right? Sword that Jun Wu gave him because the black sword was taken up by Wu Ming. And that was the end of it. Now, my theory is, and this is just a theory, but Hua Chong has always been one to hide his face, right? Is to hide his face. And we know that before, it was from the fact that he was abused by his family and always had like bruises and cuts and stuff on his face and he thought it made him look unsightly. Now... We didn't get to see his face underneath the mask, except she leaned thinking that he was smiling. Now it's like, did he, by absorbing the human face disease round two, did that disfigure him? And is his face disfigured from it? And he's afraid she going to see it and be like, uh. So I feel like that's another part of it. What's interesting is the ashes. We know Hua Chong as a ghost wasn't completely destroyed or dispersed because his ashes were still around somewhere. Where were they? Where are the ashes? Where have they been? Where, where, where? I'm thinking that he hid his ashes somewhere else. <clears throat> and so him hiding ashes somewhere else, he 
was able to go back and kind of work his way up back again, like we see the red flower and all of this. I feel like that's the case. And then he put the ashes in the ring, and that's what Shilian has now. That's that's my theory. But so we kind of get Hua Chong's origins a little bit. I still want to keep it up there because I want to know how he came back again after being dispersed. I want him to show up and tell Bai Wu because I don't think Bai Wu Shang. Now that we have gone through this arc, I don't think that Bai Wu Shang knows that Hua Chong that we see now is Wu Ming from back then. I don't think Bai Wu Shang's made that connection. I don't think he knows. I think that he just knows that Hua Chong is the Supreme Ghost and is like, yeah, that Supreme Ghost was helping you somehow, but he's no longer here, so you don't have him to help you. I, I got, I want Hua Chong to show up and be like, surprise, bitch, I've been back here this whole time. I'm the one that, I want, I want Hua Chong to show up in volume seven and be like, you created me and made me this way. So now I'm going to dispel you. Bye. I just, I need this to happen. I need this. The question is, where's Bai Wu Shang's ashes? That's the big question. And, and that's obviously why they haven't been able to kill him. So what's going on? Mm. We don't know. We don't know. I'm assuming the ashes are in Mount Tonglu, though. That's where I think the ashes are with Bai Wu Shang. I think his ashes are in Mount Tonglu. And I'm hoping that the way for them to completely destroy him is for Shi and Hua Chong to work together. Get Jun Wu involved if we have to. <laughs> get all three of them involved make it a, a, a daddy boyfriend duo to help out um get father's approval <laughs> get all the heavenly father's approval and i want them to destroy the ashes of Bai Wusheng and completely just dissolve him and i wonder if that's been part of the goshi and them's plan if the goshi and the mountain spirits were like let's lure Maybe this whole time we've been thinking they've been trying to lure Shi Li into Mount Tonglu. What if the Goshi and them have been trying to lure Bai Wu Shang to Mount Tonglu? And they're like, we know his ashes are here. Let's get him here. Let's destroy it and be done with this. So that maybe they can rest in peace. I don't know. I, we still have that whole mystery of Wu Young things to solve. We still have the fetus spirit to solve. Ling Wen, we'll talk about this in a minute. But yeah, I wonder if Hua Chong has like a disfigured appearance because of him absorbing the human face disease. And if that's going to be something where he like shows, he shows Shili in his true form and it's all disfigured from like, there's like millions of faces like etched and scarred and on his own. And he's like, there's no way Gege will love me. And Shili like, I've loved you since the moment you saved me, little ghost fire. And I'll be with you and I will like sob my eyes out and be like, it's true love. Let us have this MXTX after all this suffering. <laughs> So I'm hoping I have I have high hopes for volume seven and eight. I have no clue what's gonna happen in them, but I have high hopes after this. So my my attitude is turning around, which is great because the last several chapters have been really hard. <laughs> and so it's just and the idea of Shilian, of Shilian and Hua Chong sharing pain together. I just I that they feel pain for each other and Shilian standing up. For Hua Chong after he finds out that, that was his follower and he's like he's like that man believed in me it almost seemed like Shi Lian forgot already what he had done because Bai Wusheng was like well you you know you summon the dead and they devoured him whole and Shi Lian's like the sword the souls of the dead that I summoned he was cursed on my behalf it almost seems like Shi Lian's mind was trying to forget already what had just happened like because he was so traumatized and then he's like don't make fun of my believers. So now, Shilian of the past, let me get this right, Shilian of the past had learned that Hua Chong, little ghost fire version, ghost fire version, was also Wu Ming. So he figured out in the past that the little ghost fire that he saw from the very beginning at the graveyard was the Wu Ming that sacrificed himself to save Shilian now. And we know that Shilian, that was Shilian of the past, we know Shilian of the present has figured out that Hua Chong back in volume two to three is the same one as present Hua Chong that has been following around and helping him. Now we just need Shilian of the future to realize that, that all of these Hua Chongs have been Hua Chong from the start, that, that he's been following him the entire time. We just need the, we need future Shilian to put two and two together and be like, oh my God. This has been Hua Chong the entire time. The whole time. Like as Sally Field would say, the whole time. I don't think Bai Wu Sheng realizes this part, but he knows that part. So I need both Shi Lian and Bai Wu Sheng to simultaneously realize 
that it's been Huachong the entire time. And then for them to just banish by wishing and get him out of here. <laughs> just get Valley Girl out of here. Be like, Shelly Ann, oh my God, I didn't even know that he was their soulmate. Like, I just need that. He was his only one. And the phrasing of that, he was his only one follower from the beginning. I, mm. MXTX, what are you doing? And just how dare you mock him? And then Jun Wu showing up. Jun Wu showing up. I just, I was like, of all times, like at the end of all things, Jun Wu comes in. But to be fair to Jun Wu, he didn't really, he wasn't able to respond to Shilian until he ascended again. And then he ascended. Now, MXTX makes a choice to not show us the battle between uh, Bai Wusheng and Jun Wu. Fine. <laughs> I'm fine with it. I'm fine with it only because, I mean, I'm fine with it because at this point, wh what else is there to tell? We knew that Bai Wusheng was going to be destroyed by Jun Wu. We knew it was going to happen. So at this point, it's like, okay, whatever. Fine. Um, but then Jun Wu was so happy. He's like, see, I was not mistaken. You came back. Earlier than expected. And that's when Shelian's like, man, you've been gone for a while. Things have gotten really bad. Um, yeah, I don't deserve to come back. And what I what I love about this scene is that we've been building up the second ascension and descension for so long now. We've been building it up and come to find out. I mean, the second ascension is like Shilian describes it as one of the most heartbreaking worst moments of his life because it involved his one believer sacrificing everything to save him and involved Shilian like stabbing himself lying in a pool of his own blood for two days being in the rain going through all this emotional distress and trauma like like no wonder Shilian doesn't want to talk about it and saying it was the worst time of his life because it literally was the only upside of all this is that Shelian made the choice to, to descend. He was like, mm -mm -mm. I don't deserve to be up there and I don't want to be up there. And I just want to like have my atonement. Like he makes his atonement being like, I want you to disperse all my good luck and it will, it'll help me atone for everything that I've done so far. And I love that Shelian's in control about that. So, so we get to get rid of the second ascension and descension. I can't believe we finally found it. And it happens almost like you don't realize it until the moment that Jun Wu says, oh, welcome back. It's like, that was it. Which, this event was huge. Of course it was it. But you just, you're like, oh, shit. My thing is, it happened so soon. And then 500 years of Shelian being an Anwe is just like, Shelian being like, I was in a bad place for 500 years. Because he was sad. His one believer left and he lost his one believer that cared about him. And he was cursed, had the cursed shackles put on him and denounced his ascension. And basically was spending 500 years in exile, essentially. But it was just him accepting what had happened to him. Fuck. Mm. So for me, at this point, I'm going to replace it with just the third ascension. And why? I don't want to know theories. I, you, you novel readers that already know the answer to this question or the lack of answer if that exists. I don't want to know from you. I love y'all, but don't tell me. I want to spend these next two volumes seeing if we come across the answers to that. Uh, I'm just going to have to rewrite this whole thing. <laughs> but the third ascension of why, um, the idea of the 500 years, we'll just add this to it. Um, I've got a couple questions. And basically, like, Hua Chong, Hua Chong, I, and this goes along with his origins of how he got back to Mount Tonglu. At this point, it makes sense that if if Hua Chong was reduced down to the little flower, and at the very beginning, before they even went to Mount Tonglu, there was the representation of the kiln and the tiny flower in the kiln. That's Hua Chong. So basically, Hua Chong and Bai Wusheng both have been doing the same thing. They went from being specks of dust at the end of the second ascension to working their way back up. To where they were. Hua Chong just made it to Mount Tonglu a lot faster 
than Bai Wusheng has. Or Bai Wusheng came back and maybe isn't a supreme yet, but is a savage. Who knows? But it seems like it seems like Hua Chong made it back to Mount Tonglu a lot faster to become the supreme. It just took him 800 years. He literally spent 800 years working his way back up to the state of a savage and the state of a supreme ghost. So that begs the question. That we're going to talk about his, I guess, his state of to be a supreme. Because it took a big act of trauma to get him to turn from the little ghost fire into a savage. So what? how did Hua Chong get back to Mount Tonglu and get to the supreme state? Are we going to find that out? That That is a question that I would like to know. Um, also, we'll replace this here with what the 500 years between the second descent and um, Yongin, what happened there? Are we ever going to find that out? That's the question. Um, we still don't know about the master, Wind Master and Heshan, about the puppet situation, Ling Wind, the fetus spirit. We don't know about that. Um, the Wu Yang stuff, I have a feeling, is about to get explained. I feel like this whole bottom part is going to come out in Volume 7. And hopefully the stuff about Hua Chong is going to come out in Volume 7. Fingers crossed. Hopefully we get some answers there. That'd be nice. But I do appreciate that Jun Wu is super respectful to Shi Lian. And is like, okay, I, like, I, Jun Wu wanted him to come back so badly. He's like, you, I, it makes you wonder if Jun Wu realized what, what had happened to Shilian and he wanted him to come back to like reward him for everything he'd suffered through. But Shilian's like, I don't deserve a reward. I'm not a God. I'm not this, I'm not a ghost. I'm not a God. The way he describes it where he's like, I am not godly enough to be a God. I'm not ghostly enough to be a ghost and I'm not human enough to be human. Shilian's like, I'm just in this existence. Which is really sad. But again, that ties back to it's not the state of you, it's you. So Hua Chong being like, I don't care if you're a ghost, a god, or a mortal. I love you because you're Shi Lian. And people have pointed out that Hua Chong is not called Shi Lian by his name. He's always said your highness. If Hua Chong calls him Shi Lian by the end of this... I'm going to just be a puddle on this floor. I'm literally going to be in a Shelian crater sized puddle. Like from this set of chapters is where I'm going to be at. And Shelian's like, I have committed crimes. He's like, I did unleash the second round of the human face disease, even though a nameless ghost vanished on my behalf because of it. It doesn't change the fact that it happened. And Junwu being like, well, if you knew what was wrong, then you're already in the right. I'm like, Junwu was ready to give him a pass. Junwu was ready to give him the get out of jail free card and be like, oh, well, as long as you're aware of it, we're fine. I was like, sir, that was the one moment where I was like, oh, Junwu, you really have it bad for Shilian because you're willing to forego all these things to just say, oh, it's fine. Junwu, would you have done the same thing for Ling Wen with Bai Jing? Would you have done the same thing with Heshan admitting he was wrong about <laughs> Shi Wu doing all that? I don't think so. But you were ready to just be like, oh, well, as long as you're self-aware, Shi Lian, we're fine. I'm going to call BS on that, Jun Wu, and say you just wanted him back. I'm like, it'd be great if you had came down and told him that, like, I don't know, like 10 chapters ago. That would have been great, Jun Wu, but... No, no tea, no shade. Not going to blame him for anything. It's just funny that Shilian's like, no. He's like, just knowing isn't enough. I made a mistake and I have to accept punishment. I committed the wrong and someone else took the punishment for me. I love it. And then he's just like, well, Shilian's grown up. And I'm like, has he? At what price? You know, at what price? And he's like, if I'm no longer a god, then so be it. I don't need to be. It's so sad. He's like, he's like, I'll need a reason to banish you to the mortal realm. And then they both end up fighting for 10 minutes, fighting each other. It almost feels like that point feels like if you were shipping Shilian and Junwu, which I'm not, but if you were, that feels like the mutual breakup, right? It feels like the mutual breakup. It feels like Shilian and Junwu was like, come back home. And Shilian's like, nah, I want to end and just be friends. Let's just be friends. Can we? 
And he's like, well, then where are we going to tell everybody? And he's like, let's just have a fight. We'll hash it out, and then we'll go our separate ways. It reminded me a lot of Modao Zushi when Chang and uh, Wei Wuxian have a fight at one point in the series. They have a fight, and this feels a lot like that fight, um, where they both kind of go their separate ways. Except this ends on much better terms than the one in Modao Zushi. In Modao Zushi, that battle is on a very ba ends on bad terms. Here, it ends on good terms, where Jun was like, fine, we'll fight each other, and then we'll just call it a draw, and you go and do whatever. The thing that is like salt in the wound, though, the thing that feels like so much salt in the damn wound is that Shelian becomes a cook, which again, tying back to the mom, him becoming a cook and doing poorly. But the idea that he was doing it as they were erecting statues for, for mooching and function. And Shelian leaves a little bowl of rice for each of them. And he just accepts it. He's like, yeah. I like that he kind of calls a little bit of shade of Mu Ching being like, Mu Ching being nice. <laughs> Mu Ching being kind and compassionate. Mm. He's like, well, he's like, I guess him being generous and kind was him, you know, cleaning up all the remaining resentful spirits in the old capital of Shanla. So I guess that that's technically true. Um, he's like, in any case, everyone was grateful. But then I do like that he's like, no, there are no objections to what they're thinking about function. That's all pretty accurate, except that just, you know, it's not exactly true when he's around women. <laughs> so I like that Shelian kind of, it almost feels like Shelian kind of points to the inaccuracies around his friends that are by saying. But in the end, he's like, whatever, it's fine. And it hurts. It feels very bittersweet. It feels very bittersweet. But... He's like, that's just how it is. He's like, you'd think that they would not build temples next to each other, but he's like, Ruby, Huckleberry. He's like, they're neither going to be, he's like, both of them are going to always be at each other's throat because that's just their nature. And she lands like, I'm not going to bother with it. Let it be. And what I like is that he uses his cooking to stop the argument. They're fighting and he uses his cooking. And again, he puts that, self-harm back on himself he directs all of their anger and frustration towards him instead of to each other which is it's very bittersweet and sad and i'm like shelian but by this point shelian's used to it he has no no pride or embarrassment which i feel like in the present that pride's starting to come back a little bit and hua chong's trying to build it back up again but at this point it's gone right at this point shelian is closer to the shelian we see 800 years later at the start of the story than it is now. So, and Shelian's like, well, and Shelian, you know, he doesn't let their argument, their like frustrations get to him because they get really frustrated and they're like going to beat him up. And he's like, you just don't want to pay the bill. And he calls them out on it and they can't really combat him with anything better to say. So they're like, well, whatever. And then Shelian's like, well, then I'll just go on my way. It's not worth fighting about. And he's like, I'll just go busking. And he's like, he rolls up everything. He has a sword. So he's carrying a sword on his back. And I'm assuming it's one that Jun Woo gave him being like, don't. I feel like Jun Woo's like, fine, if you're going to become immortal, here, take this sword. But he could have gotten the sword on his own. We don't know. It could be just a regular, like the sword he ends up having. And then the white silk band on his wrist nuzzled secretly and Shelian patted it. It's like Shelian keeps Rui with him like as a constant reminder. And the fact that it was created out of the resentful energy from his parents. It's like the one thing Shelian keeps to kind of remind him of his parents. It's so sad. And the bamboo hat that he's carried for 800 years to remind him of that one follower and that one bit of kindness. Mm -hmm. And then he sees the little, the white, the red flower and says, I hope we'll meet again. I'm like, shut up. How did you even know? What are you even saying? Oh my God. Mm -mm. He doesn't even, I don't think he even realizes what he's saying. The little red flower was still dancing in the wind. Oh. Like, like just that little hope that red flower was Hua Chong being like, oh yes, we'll see each other again. It may take me 800 years, but I'll get back to you. So we know though that, here's the thing with the timeline we know that somewhere around this 500 year span that Hua Chong does become a supreme ghost. 
and does, um, or somehow, somewhere, it's it's been longer than just a few years that he's become the Supreme Ghost, right? Somewhere in this, Hua Chong has been the Supreme Ghost for at least a couple hundred years. Enough to punish the 33 heavenly officials and go after uh, Mu Ching and Feng Shin for a while now. So it's it. Hua Chong didn't just immediately become a Supreme Ghost right before Shi Lian ascended the third time. He's been a Supreme Ghost for a while. But again, there is some gaps in the timeline that's not filled out yet that I feel like the last two volumes are going to fill in the gaps for us. We just have to make it there. Right? Ah! Uh, so there were pictures. I don't know how I'm going to fit them all in the thumbnail because there was a lot of them. I don't know how I'm going to fit them all in the thumbnail, but there were quite a bit. Um, the one being Sheely and holding the white flower and, and Wu Ming just looking down at it and him questioning where it's from. So there was that. My favorite is... Of course, Shelian and the man with the bamboo hat. That one's my favorite. Like his face there. His face there is so sincere. And just realizing there was still someone who followed him. And at that point, when he was on the ground, the mask was gone. Mm -hmm. At that point, when Shelian crashed to earth as the prince, the mask was gone off of him. Because he, he was able to pull himself out of Bai Wusheng's trance, right? And then at the end, once Wu Ming was gone, because we see Wu Ming about to like get sucked up by the human face disease, which is terrifying. At that point, that's when Bai Wu Sheng is like, well, then I'm going, he's like, what does he say? He's like, let's start over. And he tries to press the mask to Xilian's face. And that's when Jun Wu shows up. And at the very end, we see him walking away our little scrap collector, or on his way to become a scrap collector, and Hua Chong's little flower is there dancing in the wind. Hmm. Yeah. So, now, I'm assuming, we're going to go back to the present. I'm assuming. Um, we might not. I, we're either going to do one of two things. We're either going to pick up and kind of skim over what's been happening since that moment, and kind of get us back to the present, or we're immediately going to jump back to the present like we did after Volume 3, or after Book 2. We're going to jump back to the present and be confronted with Bai Wusheng trying to put the mask back on Shi Lian again and making him suffer again. The thing of it is, I feel like Bai Wusheng has not changed in all these years. It's still the same vengeful spirit that it's always been, but Shi Lian has changed. And so I feel like even though Shi Lian didn't want to remember the past, and Bai Wusheng made him remember. I feel like just like at the end of book two, Shilian's going to overcome Bai Wusheng. The question is, one, is Hua Chong going to go down there and help him? Or is Shilian going to face Bai Wusheng by himself? Is Jun Wu going to show up as well? It would make sense, like I said, if if Shilian is facing off against Bai Wusheng and both Jun Wu and Hua Chong come to show, show up to help him. But it might also be really cool if Shilian has Hua Chong help him, only this time Hua Chong doesn't sacrifice himself to save Shi Lian. They just work together to defeat Bai Wusheng. And then Zhu Mu shows up at the end and is like, well, I guess I'll support your marriage. <laughs> you know, you know. I'm so curious, but honestly, this feels like a weight has lifted off of me. After, I'm not going to lie, the last three or four weeks have been rough. Like, I've wanted to read Heaven Official's Blessing, but I've had such dread going into it, being like, oh, I don't know how I feel. This feels like a big weight has been lifted off my shoulders. But now, in place of that weight, is so much curiosity for the questions we still don't have answered. So much curiosity. And now I want those questions answered. And I know answers are coming. We just have to wait a little bit for them. So... So, I hope you enjoyed this reaction and discussion. I feel like I've talked forever. I have, but <laughs> this is going to be a long video. But it's worth it, right? Worth it for all these chapters and to finish out book six or book four, volume six, and to prepare for the next one. Yay. So, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be patient. I'm going to wait till Manwa chapter 98 comes out very soon. Um, next week's chapter will be, um, chapters, part 64 will be chapters 199 to 202. So 199, 200, 201, and 202. Four chapters. Why not? Pages 13 through 44. We're just going to start out with a bang, right? Start volume seven off with a bang with like 30 pages, four chapters worth of content. 
and a Manwa chapter. We're just going to start off on the right foot with volume, uh, volume seven. So my heart, y'all, my heart. I, we better get some peak romance in the next two volumes or Romania Black is going to be really, really like, I'm going to turn into Bible Shang. So, <laughs> ah! so, uh, in the meantime, I'm curious to know your thoughts down below. Please, no spoilers, hints, or clues. But I, I hope you all have a wonderful week. Please stay safe. Take care. And yeah, I'll be back next week. And we will start Volume 7 of Heaven, Official's Blessing. <laughs> Bye!